This episode of Unregistered is sponsored by ZipRecruiter and Renegade University. At Renegade University, we now have six courses with more than 30 hours of content available, including my most recent courses, World War II, The Great Blowback, and the first part of my series on the history of the United States and the world. It's called A Dangerous Nation, The United States and the World, 1776 to 1898. We also still have available a very popular course, the topic of which we discuss in this episode. It's called What is Postmodernism? For more information and to purchase any of these courses, go to thaddeusrussell.com slash courses. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. My guest this week says that once a person is cast out from society, is socially damned, they experience tremendous liberation. And for her, this isn't just a theory. For a time, she actually lived it and proved it. Or did she? This is my interview with Janet Capron. So I was sitting in my car in Los Angeles, I think just two weeks ago, and I happened to be listening to this fairly obscure, at least in my world, left-wing radical podcast. Yes, I listen to those still. And uh, there was this woman on, a guest who had just written a book called Blue Money, and her name is Janet Capron. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes. And uh, I was listening, and after about a minute and a half, I said, oh my God, this is, this is what I've been waiting for for a long, long time someone who thinks like this. And I had been waiting, in a sense, since the 1970s. And her book is about being a many things. You know what? I'm not going to say it. I'm, what I'm going to say is the book is about freedom. But, it's, but it is set in the 70s um, when she was living here as a young woman on the Upper East Side. Some people have called it a book about being a sex worker, and even you have. But I think it is really a book about freedom in many ways, and not even just sexual freedom. It's really about, for me, a lot of different kinds of freedom. So it was a stunning thing to hear you talk about it. I hadn't read the book yet, but I immediately knew that I had to talk to you. And so I knew I was coming to New York and I immediately, I walked, I think I even sent them, somehow found you while I was walking with my phone on Facebook. And I said, please, can I interview you? And you didn't know who I was either. And uh, we're here now. And then now I'm in your apartment on, on uh, 12th Street. You've come a long way as a fallen woman. You've fallen all the way from the Upper East Side <laughs> yeah, to the, West, to the Village. West Village. Right. That's what happens to you, right? Yeah, right. Really. So I, I just want to say thank you, Janet, for having me here and for talking, but also more impor much more importantly for writing a book that I think, I hope, will become, uh, I hope will become a guide and inspiration for younger, not just women, not just women, for all of us. It's a kind of freedom that was talked about in the 60s and 70s when you were coming of age and I think is almost dead. And that's why I was so thrilled to see that maybe hopefully coming back. So everyone should go read Blue Money, listen to this interview, think about your own freedom and then go forward. So thanks. And let's talk about it. Let's talk about the basic story here, which is also unusual for a lot of people who end up doing sex work. Who were you? OK, well, yes. I mean, that's something my publishers wanted to make sure of because this was a, uh, written as a, as a novel, as an autobiographical novel. But of course, it's so autobiographical that we're calling it a mostly true memoir. Mm -hmm. But they wanted to make sure that all of, the, all of the stuff about my childhood, my background, was true because otherwise that would have been, I, for some reason, that wouldn't have been good. 
And it was true. I grew up on Park Avenue. My grandfather was a famous liberal newspaper publisher. And there was a lot of money around when I was a kid. And a lot of uh, the intelligentsia, too. So I, for a while, thought those two were inextricably linked. I thought, you know, because Max Schuster of Simon & Schuster was one of his best friends. And, God, he was as rich as Croesus. They had a... A whole house on Fifth Avenue, not just a townhouse, but a house with palladium stairways, and I don't know, it was amazing. But anyways, and my grandparents had a duplex penthouse on 68th and 5th, and the whole entire roof was like their terrace. Hmm. I mean, it was crazy. So I grew up around all of this really fabulous wealth, and by the time I came of age in my 20s, it was all gone. As soon as my grandfather died whatever is left went to my grandmother and she seemed to go through that so apparently they had lived very high off the hog they lived like they had a house in palm beach a beautiful misner house they had a, an estate on long island so it was it was really um a case of it's the true american story horatio alger you know the money was gone it was gone by the time I... It's, it's Horatio Alger in reverse. In reverse. Yeah, okay. That's what, you know, they, you never hear about that. but <laughs> It happens. It happens. But he had bought my mother a an apartment on Park Avenue, and that's that's where I grew up, went to all the best schools, and, you know, privileged up the wazoo. And then, yeah, I was uh, destined to be an alcoholic and a drug addict. I can't leave that out. <laughs> And um, why were you destined? Well, my father is a long line, apparently, of alcoholism. And even the, the Jewish side of my family, my mother's side of the family. Interesting. Yeah, were, Jews, Jews don't do that. And they, you know, they do it functionally. Mm. They were functional alcohol. Mm -hmm. It's a different brand than my father's, which was, you know, like mine, very low bottom. But anyway, so that got, got me kicked out of Bennington, basically. Bennington College. Bennington College. And, um, and I was living with a dashing prince who became a very good friend of mine, but I really wanted to get with my generation. And he was more of an old fashioned alk. He was old, 10 years older. He was that, you know, sort of Frank Sinatra rat pack kind mm -hmm. of fast boy. But I wanted drugs and, you know, I was a hippie. And this so, was about when? This was like in 1968. Oh, boy. So I joined the- Right at the height. Thing, right at the height. Yeah. And it was the bar scene in New York was uh, kind of like the club scene. Mm -hmm. it, it, there was a lot of live music, an enormous amount of drugs. And it was, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You've heard of that? That was it. I lived it, and I was devoted to it. I didn't want anything coming between me and it. Mm -hmm. I didn't want any, you know, portion of the what we call the straight world. Nothing to do with it whatsoever. And I was spoiled, you know, and... Uh, all of that. I mean, I brought all of my fucked upness to it, of course. But there was a genuine defiance going on. This wasn't like totally apolitical. There was always the sense that you had to stick it to the man, whatever you did. So when my Svengali suggested that I turn myself out, as so many of his girlfriends were doing, women that he knew, it made an awful lot of sense. I couldn't think, first of all, I was really too fucked up. I mean, half the time I was psychotic from amphetamine, from crystal meth and drinking and this and that. So there weren't really a whole lot of options open for me, okay? And how old were you? When I finally turned myself out, I was kind of late in life, I was 26. Okay. And up until then, I had just been a, you know, waif in the street, a hippie, drunk, usually living with some guy or another who was, footing the bill and keeping me in drugs and alcohol. And there was a little trust fund that I think I was getting a couple hundred a month from, which went a little further in those days. Mm -hmm. So by the time I was 26, I had done the pilgrimage to San Francisco. Now I fancied myself a poet, you know. Mm -hmm. I thought of myself as, you know, the queen of the underground, the queen of Avenue D or whatever. I came back to New York, kind of with all of that moxie, and couldn't wait to turn myself out really and there was a lot of gusto that went with this hmm. i it wasn't like oh no <laughs> enthusiastically now and before long i had joined up with um 
this terrific madam, another, you know, counterculture madam by the name of Jean, that was her real name, and she knew Margot St. James from San Francisco, who was a very political, had she was, started. She was the leader of the first sex worker right, organization. organization. Yeah. And so we had a chapter in New York. Which was called Coyote, wasn't it? It, it Coyote on the West Coast. When we, okay. we Ours was Prostitutes Organization mm -hmm. in New York. And what they did on a practical level was they really uh, outed the pimps. Hmm. And their whole crusade was you could work independently. But of course, that's a lot easier to do if you're white and middle class to begin with. And they had an actual bordello on the east side. It's this wonderful townhouse that was just, you know, running with cocaine and booze. And it was so exciting. And anyway, so I, you know, I fell in with my own, if you will. And I, I, I was bawdy. This is the thing. It was fun. And there was a sense of once you are socially damned, tremendous liberation, the, the likes of which I haven't felt since. It was a chance to be truly unconventional and, you know, not give a flying F because I'm no longer a nice girl. So I don't have to subscribe to any of it. And I, I, I can't tell you it was genuinely liberating. So when I look back on it, it's, it's, it was an exciting adventure. It's not something I'd want to repeat, or I had some very censorious lady ask me at a Q&A after a reading. She said, would you let your daughter do that? And it's not something that I'm going to recommend. It's, a, you know, it's your own call. I mean, I had a fierce libido, too, so for me it was actually kind of, I was, you know, nowadays they call it sex addiction. <laughs> But anyway, I mean, I, it wasn't the worst thing in the world, and sometimes it was good. The sex was actually good. It was rare, but, you know, just like in life. But the point is, I can't look back on it and feel remorse. I don't know why I would feel remorse. It was very good for me from the standpoint, and I've read other sex workers who said this, that I had to keep it together. I had to get manicures. I had to wear nice, you know. And I had been such a waif before that there was something actually very life-affirming about it. And I loved competing in the houses in those days. It was before escorts, and so there were actual cat houses, which were really bawdy and convivial, and I would compete with the other young things, you know, and that was fun. It was like, it was like the sporting life, you know? So, and, you know, after a while, I got kind of bored with it just because <laughs> there is nowhere you can go with it. It's not. You, <laughs> you know, just got bored with it. I, I love just that. got bored Instead with it. Instead of, you know, yeah. a life of uh, tragedy, some no, tragic right. ending, right? Yeah. Which you're, no, no. you're supposed to have in a story like this. <laughs> yeah. So, I, it, and that, you know, so it, it sort of, that was what, uh, I guess, redeemed me, if you want to use the expression, but I don't. And then, and for me, what happened was then after that, I really, the bottom rose up to meet me. I mean, I really, the trajectory was just like straight off the cliff in terms of my addiction, my alcoholism. And that is the thing that I uh, makes my book a cautionary tale, the alcoholism, the addiction, but not that little, you know, romp that I had, that little. And I have to say, my ex this is my experience. I would never extrapolate from that and say, Oh, everybody should, you know, that it's a good experience. I, I know there's a lot of people who don't enjoy it and who suffer or are forced to do it or whatever. The, this was not my experience. So I'm only writing out of my experience. That's it. Yeah. yeah. One of many things I love about the book is that you don't make, you don't speak on behalf of anyone else. No. You don't make claims for other people. No. But you're simply saying a lot of things that you're not supposed to say in the book. One of them is that you enjoyed it. You enjoyed the, some of the sex, but you... Certainly once in a while once in a while but but you loved i think you loved is that fair to say yeah much of what sex work is i love being outside of society which honestly i think that women and now it seems more than ever are so prescribed by mm -hmm. that the price you pay for being a nice girl it's too high in my opinion what's the price well i think you know my great my true hero, Germaine Greer, wrote this book, The Female Eunuch. It was published in 1970. And I think it's a great 20th century work. You know, on the, on the, uh, really on a par with Marx or Freud or anybody. 
and everything that she writes about in that book, now just think of the title, The Female Eunuch, all of that, and she finally had to write a sequel in 2007 called The Whole Woman. She said, I vowed never to write a sequel, but I felt compelled. <clears throat> and she says that things have gotten worse. And I think that they have uh, for women um, in the sense that we are so out of touch with our own bodies and our own sexuality that everything everything is skewed. And I honestly have to say, I think men are, are so bewildered and get terrible mixed messages and don't really know what's going on. And I think the same is true for, for women. We just don't know and we really are, we really have lost our way in terms of um, just basic functions like sex, like intercourse, sexual intercourse. I don't think that for the most part in our whiteness, uh, we know how to do that anymore. Yeah, it's funny. Before we started recording, you started talking about whiteness and white people and pretty quickly found out that you think about whiteness the way that I do, and, yeah. but no one else does. We'll get to that in a second. Yeah. I think you're right about that. I think it is racialized in that particular way, but we'll talk about that later. Um, yeah. So so what is Germaine Greer's argument in The Female Eunuch? Well, you know, she's talking an awful lot about vaginal orgasm. A female eunuch meaning, for instance, we're not, thank God, you know, we, we don't have to endure um, a genital cutting. But she claims that it's done in a de facto way in our society. So that the, um, the lore is, the received opinion is, that orgasm during intercourse is very rare for women. It's an anomaly. So therefore, neither men nor women try to even achieve that. That's not the goal. And what happens, Amy Schumer has this great line in which she says, and I, I, I mean, it's just the best. She says, guys, would you please try to make sure your partners come? I mean, what do you think? We're just here to witness your process? <laughs> it's, it's about witnessing your process? Anyway, so I think that's too much is the case. Is, and I just, this is based on the most minimal consensus of my young women friends. But from what I gather, these young lusty girls are not, you know, they're not having orgasms that way. And so what that means is that men, unfortunately, and it's that both men and women are, are lost in this area. This is nobody, you know, I'm not pointing a finger at men at all because women collude with this. But what happens is it, uh, largely in our culture, men end up masturbating inside of women which is a complete denial of the vulva and everything else that's there. And then women achieve orgasm. They are also masturbating. So I, I like to say we're a society of wankers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think, hmm. I don't know. I mean, I am so in favor of all of this rage that's coming up on the part of women. I'm all for it. But I'm wondering if it goes far enough. I'm not saying that women should turn against their intimate partners. In a, You're talking about the Me Too movement? Yeah, the, the Me Too right. movement. I think the rage is wonderful, but I think it doesn't quite go far enough in that I think that women have to honestly look at their own intimate consensual relationships. And the very idea that we're now free to sleep around, but not, you know, not necessarily for our own satisfaction. And, and the satisfaction from, if you happen to be hetero, um, I mean, I have to say, because I have, I have some very interesting conversations with lesbian friends of mine, and they just don't get all this stuff, the hoopla about the penis. It's like, who needs it? But no, but if you like them, you know, they work. It actually can work. Mm -hmm. And it isn't even that hard, but you have to know how, and we don't. And I mean, I, of course, pursued this over a lifetime. So I'm coming from, you know, years of, and I, I, I want to preface this by saying I'm just as inhibited and white, you know, little bourgeois white girls, anybody in this area, just as fucked up. So for me, it was a concerted effort to, to you know, to overcome this. And, um, and I paid a big price, you know. Uh, 
but I did you? But, what was the price you paid? Well, I was madly in love with someone where the sex was absolutely wonderful and and extremely gratifying and satisfying for me. And he was a nasty son of a bitch. You okay? mean this is since you were yeah, a sex worker? Yeah, I'm talking about, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, because um, <clears throat> as a sex worker, I was doing what most nice girls do. The only difference was I was getting paid for it. Right. Okay. It, and also there was something very honest about it. Yes, you're going to be allowed to use me. Yes, you may use, but I'm going to get something out of this. Mm -hmm. Now, once in a great, you know, blue moon, like it happens, like it does in life, you know, there's chemistry. And, and, and so um, it has been put to me a couple of times, but whores aren't supposed to enjoy it. I said, who says? Who, who are the whores obeying here? Who's the authority? That's, you know, another one of those false Yeah, your, your opening scene in your book describes your first trick, right? And you're terrified, and yeah. this young woman, you're going into this fancy apartment building. Some, I guess it's the Upper East Side, right? Yeah. And the man Park Avenue, the, right where I grew up. Oh, and the yeah. John is yeah. some sounds like some you know elite New York, yeah, right, uh, right, gentry. Yeah. And you're terrified and passive. You're sunk into the couch. You don't know what to do, and you're hoping that he will just tell you what to do, and he finally does. And you're thrilled by that and you go in there and into the bedroom and he comes before he even fully penetrates you. Right. and then he tells you yeah. that this is this is why he hires prostitutes is because he couldn't have regular girlfriends and right. he immediately then in your writing in the scene he becomes sad a sad figure not quite tragic but it's you're not thinking this guy is the dominant powerful patriarch who's got the power here and then you talk about your own feelings just turning around in that very moment right about this and you and you said oh now i realize that we kind of have the power i feel i felt suddenly free and powerful and i realized that this is why they pay us yes this is why they pay us yes they're worship i forget the word you use but it's something like I, they're worshiping us they need us they desire us i'm i felt worshiped i felt loved yeah. not loved but i felt lusted nope. after and that yeah. felt wonderful and liberating and powerful right yeah yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah, all in that moment. Oh. And that's what I've heard yeah. many sex workers say. Yeah. It's sort of the opposite. It's the opposite of, of what you... how sex work has, that's right. has been portrayed traditionally. Absolutely. Um, because, of course, as I'm sure you know, I've written about this quite a bit, prostitutes still, but always, have been considered victims before they started the work because, in fact, that's the way that we've explained why a, prost why a woman would become a prostitute. They, they must be forced into it either through poverty or alcoholism or some slave master, someone, some man literally kidnaps them and forces them to sell their bodies in some slave ring. But we also know that a lot of prostitutes in the 19th century and certainly in the 20th century and certainly now have said just the opposite, that much of why they did it was that it was simply a better kind of work, not great, not perfect, not always fabulous, but work that they simply preferred to washing dishes or cleaning floors or taking care of babies or working in a garment factory and all those things. Is that, does that sound about right for you? Or? Uh, oh yeah, and uh, but there really is more to Although it actually than you were that. more, I'd say you were even more enthusiastic I about was the enthusiast pleasures that I've, you found I, it, in it. It, it, it. Also, there is a true defiance, and I think that's- so It's political it's for It's been you. so pathologized, and it's extremely political, and I think for many women, you know, um, even though, as I say, I only have my experience, but it there it was. And these women were outlaws, mm. real, genuine outlaws. Right. And um, I have a lot of respect for them. And I, you know, I, I just want to make sure that my version is included in any general discussion of sex work because I'm so sick and tired of it's being pathologized and... These women as victims, they certainly didn't see themselves that way. Yeah. And nor did their clients see them that way. Right. Can you uh, describe that bordello? The one where you talk about how it felt like being on the road? That was typical of what, you know, would, would confound you. I mean, you would have these preconceived ideas of what it was going to look like and et cetera. And it was so prosaic. Um. I had a madam, though, was very interesting, Mickey, 
she lived uh, in a beautiful little jewel of an apartment, the Upper East Side, doormen, elevator men, all very proper. And um, she was actually a friend of Miles Davis, hmm. et cetera. You know, real bohemian, you know, sl- older than I, so different generation. This big chess set sitting right there in the middle of her living room. And she would get these local characters. They'd be like, uh, you know, they owned the stationery store or, you know, the lo- you know had an, uh, an office as an accountant or, in the, or just the most middle class you could possibly imagine, nice, happily married guy. This was mainly her clientele. It was a much um, uh, nicer clientele, you know, class of men than I in my free time. The men I was with were a lot wilder and a lot less mm. predictable. The men, so, who, the men who didn't pay, you mean? The men were, who didn't were wilder, pay, right. The, the ones who right. did pay were pretty were, uh, bourgeois, really middle pretty, class. Yes, bourgeois, middle class. Some of them were more, less, some of the houses were more bourgeois. It was a higher class. and But it was always a, a very, um, and kind of, there was something very ordinary about it, mm-hmm. you know? And the, these men, a lot of them, felt entitled to a piece of strange. Probably a lot of them had married maybe their first or second girlfriend, you know, and they, they, I mean, they took her virginity and they had to do the right thing. And we were going back a ways, but this was very much the case. And the idea of having sex with no strings attached, you know, that you paid up front and then you were free, was so exhilarating to them as well because they just never had a chance to do that, a lot of these guys. These were nice men. And so for them, this was just their birthright as men because that double standard, which I maintain is still alive and well in our culture, although it's gotten more insidious, but that double standard uh, is what drove them. They were whoremongers. They wanted to pay for it. Hmm. They liked paying for it that was the turn on Hmm. you know which took me a while to figure out and then i realized oh that's the thing that turns them on you know uh, maybe ooh, you know it's a little racy and all that so you offered them a piece of strange Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) i love that Mm -hmm. piece of strange so uh, why was that good for you well the thing that was good for me about it was I, you know, I got to show off, you know, how hot I was. I mean, I was, I was a very silly girl, but I, I really enjoyed, you know, I had a cute little body. I'd take my clothes off and the whole challenge was they call it a trick for a reason. The whole idea is to make the guy come just as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. It was trying to get something for nothing, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it worked pretty well and I was pretty good at it for a while. I was young. I mean, why wouldn't I be? But you know, it, when you're when you're stoned all the time as I was, and that was my main vocation hmm. was being high. It, this 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 dovetailed nicely, um, and it was and it was it 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 inspired me to keep my act together at least on the outside. So um, I had a nice wardrobe and all that, and that was important because I had really been in the street prior to this. I was really going down fast, which I ended up doing anyway once I left this life. Um, but I, it was it was a kind of a vocation in a way. Mm-hmm. I, I can't I can't really say it wasn't. Some of the best writing in the book is simply descriptions in minute detail of the pleasure you experienced from sex and from drugs. Yeah. Again, those aren't things you're supposed to say, Janet. No. You're supposed to say, well, well I, yeah. I went down that road. Yes. I was lured into it. I was seduced by it. <laughs> But then I quickly realized it would lead me to destruction. But no, you kind of leave it there. You have these very elaborate descriptions of exactly what it feels like to have sex in various ways, exactly what it feels like to do crystal meth and to drink rum. And you move on. You don't apologize. You don't talk about it as a tragedy. You just leave it there. And it's that to me in itself is liberating because that's the one thing we don't hear, certainly about drugs. We don't hear about how good they feel. Drugs nobody, make you feel good. That's why we do them. Nobody talks about that. Like, why do people do this? And why are they slaves to it? And why, you know, nobody talks about the fact, well, hell, you get high, you know? Now, I mean, I'm not, I, it almost destroyed me. Yes, it mm-hmm. did. 
but I had to be true to that experience. And it's very hard to write about what it feels like to be in that altered state when you're no longer in it, which I certainly am not. And as I certainly would have died out there. And um, I'm very grateful for the fact that I no longer do those things. But while I was doing that, for most of the time that I was doing it, I was incredibly high. You know, <laughs> really, I mean, I love crystal meth. Oh, I've never met a speed drug I didn't like. In fact, oh, me the too. The crystal meth is the best because drug you get, of choice. You basically, get six to eight hours of the cocaine high for about one tenth of the price. And after a while, it levels off and you feel immortal. Hmm. Oh, this is not. I've overcome all these base needs like eating and sleeping, and mm -hmm. you know, and I'm here, and it's oh boy. And what did it feel like? Well, you know, for me, I guess because I'm a depressive. Do you remember the first time you did yes. speed? Oh, this is so funny. The first time I did with this, my Svengali, who I write, he turned me on to, I write about him a lot. And a lot of people don't understand he was not a patron. He was not a drug dealer. Is this Michael? In Michael, the, in yeah. The book? Okay, he, he's sort of a quasi-pimp. He's not, he's not even. He's not really a pimp. He doesn't he's, take any money for right. it. Right. People don't he's understand the, those times <laughs> anymore. So they're trying to figure out who, what his, you know, what he was doing. I mean, how did he survive? Well, the owner of this saloon gave him the run of it and he 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 transformed it into this hippie, you know, it was called Dr. Generosities in real oh. life. And Dr. um Dr. He, Generosities. Dr. Generosities and he he'd come up from the West Village, which in those days was, you know, uh, Bob Dylan was passing the hat and all that. So he came from that background, he came uptown and he brought that with him that downtown mm -hmm. zeitgeist where was so it it was on 73rd and 2nd okay so what happened was all these musicians whom he knew and a lot of them very famous would come up there to try out new material and we were all so sophisticated and everything that we wouldn't make a big fuss over them and they could do their thing and and everybody you know so who were these musicians oh, well like you know, in the book, I have Richie Havens. I call him Tommy Shelter. Oh, there were all kinds of people. Taj Mahal, Dr. Mm -hmm. John, all these really wonderful musicians, too. Oh, the, didn't, uh, the, so many. Did the Beatles make an appearance? They didn't they play did. there, but they... They did. It was actually another saloon up the street called Mike Malkin's, mm -hmm. and we were all dancing on the bar, okay? I mean, the girls were all in there. Like, like it was just a wild what, time. Go-go dancers. Yeah, we were doing, you know... But there were, weren't there go-go dancers? Dilettante go-go dancers. Like, yes. Yeah, go-go dancers in their off hours would be dancing on the floor. Right. We'd all be up there, you know, d d speeding and doing poppers. And, oh, God, I mean, it was just crazy wild. And then what we would do was lock the door to the bar. So it would just be all of us in this, this I call it St. Vitus dance frenzy. Mm -hmm. And and the jukeboxes were all customized. So you have to understand, every single 45 on that jukebox it wasn't a commercial hit on it it would be all the b-sides or all the off you know wonderful wonderful jukeboxes anyway so um and we'd all be dancing and drinking and god only knows what and in the midst somewhere these poor beetles and i forget which two it was <laughs> i really do poor I, I i forget <laughs> but they were there with their then manager um What's his name? Uh, was pretty famous. And they were, they were sort of sat at a table in the back, and nobody was really paying any attention to them. And this is at the height of their, you know, 1968. And so they finally kind of slunk out into the night, you know. Hmm. And it was really a point of pride with us. Um, this is the essential New York coming-of-age experience, and you didn't... Um, the whole idea was if a musician came in either to play or to hang out, he was on your turf, mm -hmm. you know, so. So you're, you were also of the cultural avant-garde at the time. It, that scene was. It, the avant, you know, what was so wonderful about the 60s and 70s is that it, the energy was all in the music, right? And it just burst out. So we were all but part you, you of it. You played only the B-sides. Right. That's, oh, that's yeah. the avant-garde. Oh, yeah. No. Well, sort of. Yeah. I guess you would call it that. We, we were all, you know, we were so, 
deeply into the music. Mm. We were so wedded to it. It was like with you 24 hours a day. And you weren't really snobs, I guess. You were just not as exactly. interested in the mainstream. Not snobs. I mean, we loved the, the Turtles, too. The Beatles were just simply you know, less interesting or not as interesting. Well, no, they, as were, the... they were plenty interesting. We were making a point of ignoring them, so mm. they oh, wouldn't okay. feel... <laughs> that was... Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, everybody was... Oh, so they great. wouldn't feel what? So, the, so that they wouldn't... Um, feel mobbed the way they would any place else right. or you know they could enjoy supposedly yeah. they could have a good time you yeah. see so nowadays when yeah. people think cultural avant-garde or at least when i think cultural yeah. avant-garde i think of very put together young men and women with very carefully chosen attire serving artisanal brussels sprouts in a restaurant in williamsburg and it's it's all lovely and delicious but there's not a whole lot of fun that you're describing. What you're describing is just a lot of fun. A lot of fun. So we have that. And then also when... A spontaneity. When people now... Yeah, spontaneity. Yeah. And when now people think about feminism these days, and certainly when I think about feminism yeah. these days, yeah. I think of <laughs> not fun at all. No fun. In fact, it's exactly. almost anti-fun. Yeah. And so what you... Your life then, in a way, it sounds like there's this convergence of the cultural avant-garde in that way the hipsters of the time, hipsterism of the time, and feminism, because there's a defiance, you said, to stick it to the men, which is a funny uh, right. turn of phrase. But what comes out at that convergence is this bacchanal, just sensual, just incredible amount of sensual pleasure that you're celebrating and just you're inhabiting the pleasure. And that's much of what the book is arguing in a sense, is that the best thing to do for you is to simply be in the pleasure in the moment. And that in itself is political in the best way by almost being not political. You're just being in yourself and you're just reveling in the feeling you get in your clitoris and hmm. from the speed that's in your blood. You know, so I, there was a, yeah, there was a poet. that's a po happened since then, right? Oh, because geez. we don't do those it's things. It's over. We don't talk about those things. Yeah, right? it was before 1984, okay? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah. so the... I had this poet friend of mine say that he'd be pointed to some guy who was on, you know, quaaludes and was like, couldn't stand stand up. And he said, he's, because remember, everybody, everybody who was able-bodied was going to Vietnam at this time. Mm -hmm. So he points to him and says, he's not fit to push a broom. With pride, he says. Mm -hmm. He's not fit to push. In other words, you know, a lot of people were dropping out in every single sense that you could. And I was just a creature of my times in that sense. But a lot of us felt as if this was the last gasp. There was a funny feeling of, like, this is a swan song. Oh, really? You knew then? Yeah. What was to come? And that was especially the, the <laughs> new, especially, <laughs> especially the new wave, the yeah. punk thing, was, yeah. uh, was um, you know, you just, you, you felt it huh. encroaching on you, you know. So, what did you think uh, of punk? I loved it. I was a part of it. I loved huh. it. That was my last gasp, too. So you're talking about the late 70s, like the, yeah, begin, the, late the very 70s. beginning of punk. Yeah, and I got sober in 81. That's so. before, that was before punk became about anger. No. Masculine punk was, anger uh, and no, yelling. <laughs> punk was always about anger, but Chrissy Hines or Patti Smith well, or all these people were righteously angry, too. No, but it was so, just about anger in the 80s. It was just about anger in the 70s, too. You think so? It was, Yeah. yeah. It, that's what was beautiful about but you know i mean well the father of it all lou reed and of course his thing was uh, was heroin mm -hmm. you know he sung about that as, as lovingly as i write about crystal meth but we were all uh, coming from that tradition that had been established probably by baudelaire but then a big influence on me was william burroughs and the book that he wrote junkie in which he writes about what it feels exactly. like it's just a, a reportage there's no apology there's no the conclusion i i've come to is that this had this men had done this this is not unprecedented but truly no woman had done it because whenever a woman seem seemingly until recently would write a tell-all then she would have to say mea culpa and beat her breasts and say i'm dancing as fast as i can or whatever the hell it was and I'm now so filled with remorse, but I've seen the light and all this crap. Well, no, I wasn't going to do that because that would be totally false to the experience as far as, you know. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't going to happen. Yeah. So that, so those bordellos, they were owned and operated by women. By which, women, totally. Which is totally. also unusual. And so... No, that's a tr long-standing thing. So in the 19th century, yeah. feminists, the yeah. first wave feminists, and 
basically Christian conservatives joined together to shut down all the brothels, which were everywhere in the United States. Until that happened, women mostly owned and operated brothels. Yes. They were the madams. And right. They had the power. Women had the power in that industry. And they, yes. many of them were extremely wealthy. And the women who worked for them were some of the highest paid workers of any sex right. in the United States. And then when they were shut down, like when the laws were actually enforced by the turn of the 20th century with the social purity campaign, which was a, a suffragist slash Christian conservative movement that was extremely successful. They actually boarded those brothels up and threw the women out onto the streets. Once that happened, then, of course, the industry oh, the was pimps. taken over by male criminals who were pimps. And yeah. so since then, most sex workers who are women, most sex workers have worked for men, I think. No. Uh, well, no, no, I mean, no. you do say that the madams were of this sort of countercultural political movement like Margot St. James and Coyote. Not all of them. I mean, there okay. was that ele that was definitely a part of it. But no, there was all of the everybody that whom well, I worked for. There were no pimps whatsoever. Why? Involved. Because certainly there were many, many pimps in the, you in, had, you, in the United you States. Couldn't, you couldn't walk the street because most of the streets, literally the turf, the, the sidewalks were owned by pimps. Right. So there were a few areas like around Waldorf Astoria for some reason. That was free territory. So, okay, so right, that's what I meant. So yes. you had- So street walkers, street walkers were yeah. Um, yeah. Under, under the thumb of, of But pimps. as soon as you got into whorehouses, that but was there just all weren't that, I guess there weren't that <clears throat> many brothels because they were so illegal by that point. Oh, they were at, right out in the open. And then, let in me the tell 70s, you, like, oh, only, God, yeah. How many were there? Oh, they Manhattan? were all over the place. Most of them on the Upper East Side. Oh. And everybody just, you I'm just tipped the doorman, he looked the other way, oh, please. And then on top of that, along comes massage parlors. Right. Massage parlors were the rage there for a little while. And that was fun. Yeah, you, have <laughs> that a, you have a so great, fun. you have a moment. There's a, yeah. you're given an opportunity, a job yeah. offer basically to do hand jobs for 15 minutes in a massage parlor oh, in it, Times Square. And you're yeah. more so into it. And why no. was that? Oh yeah. So that was, um, that was the live sex show chapter. One of my favorite mm -hmm. chapters in the book. So this guy was an empresario of sorts. He had the, in the front, it was an abandoned movie theater in Times Square, this huge, okay? And so he had these live sex shows on the stage of this huge palace. Which is what Times Square was of, then. That's, that's yeah. What, yeah, but it, it's amazing to think of this huge space that he could just have for a song. And anyway, and all the, um, I think, it, I forget whether it was uh, CBS or NBC or somebody, they, all those execs would come to see the live sex show in their lunch oh, yeah. hour and stuff. Oh yeah, it was hilarious. So, but in the front he had these little mas uh, massage tables. It was one of the early massage. He was way ahead of his time because massage parlors hadn't taken off yet. Mm -hmm. But he had these little massage tables and he had timers. You got 15 minutes, hand jobs only. And these poor there, guys there were would timers. come. I love that. Yeah, timers. Yeah. And these poor guys would come in to get hand jobs. And I just thought that was a little cold. My friend was doing it, you know. <laughs> And I just thought, well, gee, I mean, I kind of like, you know, um, the, the whole male female thing that could sort of parody. I think you said it mimicked. I mean, mimics, what you, yeah. what you normally did sort of mimics Mim yeah. regular heterosexual Ra relations. Ra right. And this right. did not. And, and that's this, why you didn't like it. This was like a little out front. So yeah. it wasn't that it was more exploitative to you. That's not why you didn't take the job. Did you? Well, you I don't mean, really it, use that term in your book. No, I just never thought in those terms at all. That I mean, it's still hard for me to think, and I just hmm. don't relate to that at all. Well, can we just stop there for a second and think about that? Why do you, you know, because of course exploitation is the very first word out of everyone's mouth pretty much when they talk about prostitution. Certainly women and feminists, I think, you know, not all, but overwhelmingly in this country, people use that term right away. It's exploitation. That's what it is, they think and say. So why are you not? thinking that so How is it even hard for you to relate to that okay so here's what really, happened to you <laughs> you're really getting you know you're getting me to talk about this and even more even more frankly than than i might otherwise so i blame you but okay here's what i i think you know you just told me about this movement of feminist suffragettes that, that shut down all the brothers which i'm ashamed to say i'm very ignorant of and i'm dying to read about but i do know about carrie nation Mm -hmm. And Carrie Nation led this movement that led to temperance, right? I have this harebrained theory. Let's not say that, you know, I'm a creative person. This is just a theory, but based on some reading, including the female eunuch, etc., that 
what happened with Carrie Nation was the husbands when at payday were going into these taverns where there were groaning boards, there was all kinds of food, and I guess there was a brothel upstairs, etc. So the men were spending all of their money and all of their time in these in these places. And the you know, there was those pictures of the little children standing outside in the mm. cold, daddy, daddy, please right. come home. So what happens is when women are left out completely of uh, uh, whether it's pleasure in this case they mm. weren't even getting enough to feed their mm. own young mm -hmm. naturally they're going to rise up in a righteous rage and i think the me too movement although i don't think there's a person who's really active in it who would cop to this but and say oh it's not about that and it's about so much more so i'm not going to say that this encompasses everything but i do think one element is that because in the actual sex act women are just witnessing men's process for, for the most part and in it this is not true in all cultures but definitely in ours that there's a kind of a you know you have to deny yourself believe me in ways that you can't even imagine as a man and it's it's a it, it so it's consensual and the women are very much with no expectation having this act not they wouldn't dream of imposing on the man you know hey you have to make me come or anything like that it's mm -hmm. like no it's not part of the it's not part of the protocol it's not part of the poly tests so there's this very interesting convention right now um and uh our mores are such that women are really being left out. And if you look at the pornography, and here's where I'm, I'm actually anti-pornography, it's completely male-centered, and it's all about the male orgasm. And the women at best will fake it, completely fake it. But you know damn well they're faking it. It isn't even, because it's not even, it's, they're, they're witnessing the process, they're there. And you know, it's completely uh, phallic-centered, if you will. Okay. And I think that is true, unfortunately, in intimate consensual relationships a lot of the time. Okay, so that doesn't answer my question, though. And I, I do want to pursue that because it's fascinating. But um, exploitation, well, why do you not think of it as exploitation? Because I think women are indeed exploited, but I think they're exploited in their intimate consensual relationships. Oh, in the, un in the unpaid sex. In the unpaid sex. I think that is true exploitation because right. they're not even getting paid. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, my friend Maggie McNeil, who I told you about, sex worker, activist, and intellectual, uh, often makes fun of women who uh, have sex for no money. Yeah. Well, in the sense that we don't know how to do it anymore. Mm. Because when, when we do, and when it's working, you know, women get the better end of the thing. I'm mm -hmm. telling you. Yeah. They do. Men are plugging into the life force or whatever, yeah. and men get to go along for the ride. Yep. But women are, you know, it's really about when you make it about the woman's satisfaction as opposed to about the man's, because the man's going to come anyway. So we're not really concerned with that. But if you make it about the woman's satisfaction, you know, I can't speak for men, but I think they dig it too, obviously. And certainly their egos dig it. Uh, the men, they men dig, I've known. They dig what? Well, the men I've known who've been able to satisfy me had insufferable egos and were extremely pleased with themselves because they, they could do that to make uh, make you reach orgasm right well so isn't that counter to your claim about what's going on in the culture generally no i don't think you're going to achieve parity or equality i just think you're going to be satisfied which and in a very very real and deep way right okay so you're saying which is a nice place to start so you're saying you know? the, the masturbating inside of a vagina yeah. is not universal it's just common i it's, think it's the co prevailing yeah mode in our culture our whiteness prevailing culture. mode Pre i think prevailing mode you're probably right i think yeah. you're probably right about that yeah so what you need to do i don't know if you have but you need to go to pornhub.com immediately after this interview and do your research because that's where the research is to be done on this and right I, I tell people all the time go to porn sites yep. and just look at it and look right. at all the categories because they now categorize it yep and everything's searchable and you can rank no my men, men for it, yeah Pornhub. but i go and i still see the same thing repeated over and over well, i don't see consensual orgasmic intercourse i see women getting off you know jerking off in wonderful ways okay. that, are, that are very appealing and I think that's what women do now. I'm not saying they don't achieve orgasm, but they do it other than in intercourse. But I think when you're having intercourse, it doesn't mean it's going to happen every time or that there's some 
rule of thumb or that I'm dictating that this is the way it should be. I'm just saying when it when the assumption is that you're not going to have an orgasm that way, mm -hmm. something is very sure. wrong. Oh, sure, okay. sure, sure. My, my only question is how many men have no interest in the woman having an orgasm? I think it's not that. I think they would love it, but I think a lot of men Oh, they've think given up on They've given up. I exactly. They assume exactly. She can't. Exactly. Thank you. I see now. You got it. Totally got now it. Now I'm all with you. Yep. Yep. Okay, because I was right. going to tell you that last time I checked, yeah. I think it's in the top 10. I think it in the and there's like 60 or 70 categories yeah. in, on Pornhub. Uh, I think in the top 10 is squirting. Squirting porn is super popular, right? Which is right. of course demonstration that she's reached an orgasm it's like proof it obviously there's though. some desire that's not true well it has nothing it, to do with it. whether mean, that, that, when you're when you're young you're going to be squirting at when you're no matter what that's not has nothing to do with it what do you mean well I'm, you can't I mean, fake it is my point no but that's not it, female orgasm is not about it's not about squirting that'll happen during the course of the intercourse. No, I'm just, I'm suggesting. The actual orgasm takes place way back in the cervical. Oh yeah, no, no, I'm just saying that, I'm just saying that I think. Cervical stump, it spasms and it. I'm just it, suggesting that there clearly are a lot of men who get yeah. very turned on by women reaching orgasm. That's all. But that isn't an example of it. Why not? Them women squirting Why not? isn't an example because you can squirt long before you have an orgasm. Oh, without an orgasm. Of course. Oh, sure. I know it's possible, but no, not... it's probable when you're young. But it doesn't no, matter that's because it's just a precursor to. It, regardless of that, yeah. the physiological part of it is even if that's not an orgasm, men right. I think are perceiving it as no, proof of, of orgasm. Of course they would. Of which just proves that nobody that men want of course you they do. to have an orgasm. Of course they do, and I would say in this case that women are so convinced now because of the prevailing belief that that's not going to happen and because it takes them a long time and they're embarrassed and there's something else too that you have to remember about female sexuality it's complicated so we don't need to have an orgasm in order to reproduce therefore our orgasm is totally frivolous mm. Right. And I write about this in an essay. There's a, a tribe in Africa where they didn't do the, the genital cutting, and the surrounding tribes called them the butterfly people, the frivolous people. They're frivolous. <laughs> really? Yeah. And, and there is something about female pleasure, not to mention satisfaction, that is completely frivolous. It's beside the point. Mm -hmm. And women are a little embarrassed by They think in their mind somewhere... It's not really necessary. Right. It's not that important. It's not the it, point. It's not productive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's not valuable. It's not valuable. <laughs> right. Right. And it's not uh, socially valuable. It's not socially valuable, and it seems like a terrible imposition. And the last thing you want to do is embarrass the man and make him feel inadequate, and right. on and on and on. But you know, women have all kinds of reasons. But the main one is, as you say, everybody's given up. Not everybody. Not everybody. I can, no, of I can course tell not. you for sure, because not I can't come if she doesn't come. Right, right. If she can't come, and I realize she's not, or yeah. just that she's not into it in any way, it's right. over. I'm, well, I yeah, will but stop, and it's you're, done because you're it, healthy and you're functional. And there's a lot of people, uh, hopefully, out there like that. I think so. But I think culturally speaking, the majority of people, and I, as I say, based on my limited little yeah, I don't survey. Know. It's still very widespread that women will have sex casually without any expectation of coming that way. Mm -hmm. And that means something's wrong, something's off. Because if we were connected, in the, and, and by the way, I mean, for me, it always involved a lot of skin and a lot of, it was none of this poly test of the guy being, you know, far, far away from me, he would be like, where on top of me that for me you know as a person like mm. but but i'm just saying there's so there's there's all of this you mean, protocol wait, to make you reach orgasm you yeah. needed a lot of skin, of skin on a skin lot of contact. chakras yeah okay. connecting yep. there was a connection mm -hmm. all the way which you know it was a part of it for me but my point being yeah it wasn't compartmentalized it wasn't just 
just the cock and pussy. Cock and pussy, right. yeah. exactly. <laughs> and we, we can say anything on this podcast. Okay, that's so I know. I worry. love this podcast. I love it. <laughs> well, I love I your can't book, it. and it's. I find it funny that you were squeamish because your book is so frank about all these things. Yeah. So no, let it loose. Yeah. Go ahead. But to me, it's getting more and more specific as I go on with this argument. It's getting more and more graphic because, and it's not something I ever really wanted to talk about except in the light of this Me Too thing and everything. Yeah. I just feel it's so important to say, wait a second, the power that you want in these situations is to be able to choose who's going to use you, you from go. what I can gather. Yeah, which is a major argument in your book because that's what you felt was really going on Yes, in sex work, as you experienced, yes. was that you were deciding when you had sex and with whom and when, Right, which is the opposite of how we think about it. Right. Now, however, what if you were destitute, right? Re yeah. Really needed the money. Yeah. You would, then you have less of a choice, correct? I think for a lot of women um, whom I met, and I met a lot of people who were from really impoverished backgrounds and everything, it was still a choice. Mm -hmm. It was still a choice, a much more attractive one than it would be for someone from my background, of course. Right. So you were being but, subsidized a little bit, right, from the trust fund? Not, no, or? by that time, okay, yeah, I had, I guess it was like, uh, it was a couple hundred a month. Okay. And by the time I, when I was 30, and I write about it, this in the book, I came into the principal, which was like $50,000, that my mother had tried to get taken away, and they, they, they wouldn't do it. So you did need to work to live? I needed to work. Okay. And that was shocking to me. I was not prepared for that. I have this line in the book where I say to my Svengali, you know, he says, what are you going to do for bread? I, I don't know. You know me. I always thought the world owed me a living. Right. So this and wasn't just a hobby or an avocation. It was well, a vocation. I had to, I had to do something. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I, and I said, I always thought the world owed me a living, you know, but of course I have every, please, let's not forget. I'm very, very privileged. I could have done anything. No denying. But as I say, I was somewhat hobbled by the fact that I was, a, you know, an outrageous alcoholic and drug addict. I mean, that'll, you know, it's hard to function. But so, but you but, described your work in the bordellos as yeah. almost like an assembly line, except you don't, I mean, you're not, you don't find it to be degrading. Mm. You don't no. find it to be exploitative. You actually talk about... no. The thing that you didn't like yeah. in the bordellos yeah. is that you sometimes had to wait around for men. And right. that's what you I hated. hated. You hated, I hated waiting it. for men. And actually, that's yeah. when you actually thought about maybe it would be better to be a streetwalker because you don't have to wait around. Exactly. Yeah. yeah and I have an example of one of one high class call girl who loves to hit the street for exact. Because in those days, we didn't have cell phones and stuff. Yeah. And you were really, oof. And you had answering services, so you couldn't overuse that because, right. you know. But so how many easy. men in a day would you have sex with? You know, that's a good question. A lot. A lot. I was a popular girl, especially in the massage parlors. Oh, my God. Give us a ballpark. I don't know. 5, 10, 20? Yeah, something like that. Somewhere between <laughs> 5 and 10. And then I would do. Then I would go to my love interests after work. Wow. And do it for free. Well, that's the advantage of being awake 24 hours, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh right, because you were And speeding. so yeah. I really tested that theory of Mark Twain's that we have this huge capacity. And th that's right. Hmm. We do. Huge sexual capacity. Huge. Or huge Women. capacity for pleasure. Women do. Women do, right. Yes. Right. Right. So you're you're basically repudiating the idea of the female eunuch. Yes. Right. And I was consciously, too, I mean, looking, always now looking for a way to get in touch with my sexuality. I mean, it's true I went to extremes to do that, but that was a part of it. Yeah. And you were involved with some radical feminist group? Early, yes, I had on. been. I had been. I I was uh, for a little while working with Robin Morgan, mm -hmm. and we had um, it was called okay. Abby Hoffman had this, you know, it was a uh, underground. Uh, I guess it was a monthly, and it was called Rat, and we had this ceremonial thing where the radical feminists took over the rat from Abby. I mean, he essentially turned it over, you know, past the baton or whatever, but we we made it like a, we took it. Hmm. It was more ceremonial than anything, but the idea was, we, you know, we took the rat over. Robin Morgan was one of the feminists who had burnt her bra. Mm. I don't know if you know about yeah, that. Sure. But 
at the was that the Miss America pageant? Yes, mm -hmm. and she she was actually hetero and was married with a baby, mm -hmm. which was interesting. But most of the women who were involved in this particular thing were lesbian. And they were mostly Maoists, I seem to remember. And they were butch, man. Did you say Maoists? <laughs> Maoists, oh, yeah. Maoist lesbians. They're, Maoist always, lesbians. they're always a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was exactly, yeah. Are you hiring? Every business needs great people and a better way to find them. Something that's better than just posting your job online and then praying that the right people will see it. ZipRecruiter knew there was a smarter way. So they built a platform that finds the right job candidates for you. ZipRecruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right experience, and then invites them to apply to your job. They even spotlight the strongest applications you receive so that you never miss a great match. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other hiring sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on the right candidates finding you, it goes out and finds them. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. This system has revolutionized the way that businesses hire people. The right candidates are out there. ZipRecruiter is how you find them. And right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Russell. That's two S's and two L's. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Russell. One more time, to try it for free, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Russell. ZipRecruiter the smartest way to hire. Yeah, so I was going to say, so, so Abby Hoffman, this was his magazine? Magazine. And then Rat, we had... And then he turned it over it to these Maoist tablet, lesbians? You know, this little tablet, and he turned it over to these... Now, Abby Hoffman was a co countercultural libertine. He was, yes. He was this part of the new left that I love, that, yes. I, that I wish would come back, and I think right. you were a part of, right? Yes. But Maoist lesbians, well, Maoists, well, certainly, were not yep. part of this. Nope. In fact, they were very puritanical very lesbians were here or there on this yeah. question but a lot of them certainly Ma re i would say that lesbian feminists at that time who were, you know who were uh, very political in that way tended to be pretty puritanical right and that was kind right. of the root of i think where we are now with feminism in terms of its hostility towards exactly. sexual freedom exactly which okay. which is why i left i rebounded i ran out of there like a bat out of hell and went back to my old and your Svengali See. said to you something like, why are, why are you no longer a feminist? Or he yeah. was teasing you, right? It was, said, yeah, he was giving me Now you're time. turning tricks, you're no longer yeah, a feminist. And you said, yeah. At least well, to yourself, you one. said it he was, was too austere. Suggested. Yes. Too austere right. to be I'm a feminist. I'm just a Sybarite, I said. Yeah. So, yeah. Sybarite. Yes. Yeah, what the hell? Yeah. What happened? Because yeah. there was what we now call sex-positive feminism. Right? Yes, there certainly then, was. And that's, Germaine Greer was the yeah. was the mastermind, really. That's when it began. So brilliant, yeah. And you... You're kind of, um, you're right, you come out of that past. Right. It's almost That's like a time, your, your book's like a time capsule, yeah. actually, for me, you know? Yeah. And it's like, I tell people, no, there really was a new left that <clears> was <throat> interested in cultural <clears throat> freedom and sensual pleasure, because it doesn't happen anymore on the, on the left. And there was feminists, <laughs> there were feminists who were not just for equality, legal equality, which almost everyone's for, basically, in some sense, or most people are. There were feminists who were actually promoting the idea of female sexual pleasure and promoting the idea of heterosexual sex. Not the idea, they were promoting the pleasure. They were saying that the pleasure itself is good and we should simply allow people to enjoy it. Okay, so this is the unregistered... Unregistered podcast? But it's it's underground. What do you mean? I mean, it's count, we can say things here because I, I draw fire. Oh, so, there is so much, and and it, and it seems we like, can say anything, and yeah. it seems to it seems to people who are genuinely enraged by um, by the way they've been treated by men that I that I am somehow capitulating, or I'm you know like I'm a collaborator or something. You know, right. I should get my head shaved, but honestly. One of the things that disturbed me the most, so first of all, I'm a big fan of Louis C.K. I just mm -hmm. happen to be. And I even think he's kind of hot, although my men friends do, don't get it because he doesn't look that way to a guy. No, but to women he is, actually. Mm -hmm. So now he's got his... Okay, so we're talking on unregistered. I wouldn't even do this to poor <laughs> Doug Henwood. 
So he's got his his beautiful big fat <laughs> penis D D out. Just so people know, Doug okay. Henwood is the Marxist. He's uh, wonderful, but he Marxist who had the podcast on which I heard you. Yes, yeah. he's wonderful, but I wouldn't you know put him through. He's that. actually on the le for people for Marxists. He's yeah. out fantastic on fantastic. these questions. Actually, oh, he's, he's wonderful, and he's one of the very very few. Oh, he absolutely yeah. is, and yeah. he's also interviewed other sex you know sex yeah, he's workers and all kinds of. So Henwood wouldn't say what. But I wouldn't necessarily put him through this. But what mm. I'm going to say is mm -hmm. now. Okay, Louis C.K.'s got his big fat dick out. See, I would be aroused by that. Now, I might not like the fact that he wants oh. to jerk off in front of me, okay? I might not like that. Hey, put it back in your pants, Louis. Mm -hmm. You know, please. Which he would do. You know this guy would do. First of all, these two gals, their careers didn't depend on Louis C.K. Mm -hmm. They had no reason to put up with it. They were saying it. They were saying that it was a nightmare. Now, I think when I I don't, I don't know. Maybe they're not straight. In which case, I understand. If you're a lesbian, I guess that's a would it be a nightmare icky. though? Okay, exactly. But if you're a heterosexual woman, because you know and I've seen dicks, right? Okay, I have no interest in yeah. having them inside of me. Yeah, and so it's is that a nightmare? No, no excuse me. No. But if you're but if I'd rather not see it. All right, let's say you're a heterosexual woman. You know, in the mm -hmm. flower of your youth. And you see a hard penis, I would think you would be aroused by it. That's because I think that's like, that's me anyway. You know, you might be annoyed that you are aroused and therefore, A, you know, Louie, really, you know. But the fact that it's a nightmare and that it's traumatizing, that worries me, disturbs me a lot. Why? How far have we gone down that road? That are we such are we pre nubile children that we need the parietal care of society to protect us from being victimized by the opposite sex? If seeing a penis is I mean, if you're assaulted by that, okay, if that's some kind of crime against you. I'm worried for you. I really am. You know, I mean, I, okay. The science that's been done, it turns out women are very easily aroused visually, by the way. Oh, really? Contra oh, yes. Because, of course, the, the stereotype, at least, is that men are uh, visually oriented right. sexually and, and women are right. emotionally, turns out, emotionally oriented. This is right. fascinating. A whole bunch of... These are serious clinical, you know, verifiable, repeatable. So women like studies. looking at dicks. Okay, so they would wire up the genitalia of women, and and they gave them all kinds of things to look at. It turns out that women are pansexual. We can see bonobos doing it; we get aroused. You know, dolphins doing it; we get aroused. Uh, women together, men together. You know, men and women, we get aroused. But then our heads say, oh, no. So we'd be writing down at the same time in these clinical studies, you know, how did you react? Oh, it was no big deal. Meanwhile, the genitalia is all lit up. Oh, boy. Now, the interesting really? thing about straight men, and I use this in my you next gotta book. you got to show me these studies. Uh, the book is by Daniel Bergner. Okay. It's called What Do Women Want? You know, which was Freud's big question. Too bad it's a man who wrote it. But oh, no, no. What it is, it's it's nonfiction. It's a compendium no, I I, of all the clinical studies. I'm not I'm not disputing no, it. But I'm all just saying these, that it's too bad if we were a woman. It would well, go most over of these better. most of these clinical studies are uh, conducted initiated, by women? conducted by women. Okay. Yeah. And so. Uh, so, wow. Right. That's a, yeah. That's not, if that's true. That's true. And what's interesting about, about what's this is, there, listen right? to this. Men, when they give the same test studies to men. Right. Mm -hmm. If they're heterosexual men. The only thing that turns them on is a man and a woman together or two women together. They're very, they're actually very narrow. As my mother was used to say, oh, men are such prudes. And that is true. Hmm. Whereas women are physio biologically, physiologically not. Right, because you were having some sex with women, weren't you? Oh, sure. In the we 70s, used to call least, that, yeah. we used to call that freaking. And, and you said, yeah. you said the first time you you ate pussy. Uh, oh, yeah, that yeah. It wasn't as, what'd you say? It wasn't as like you expected it to be like flabby, a flabby piece of flesh or something, a, but it was actually hole. more. But it was this this pulsating thing with this gravitational pull, yeah. and it was almost uh, it was scary. 
Yeah, with such a strong sexual in organ. A, in a good way, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so women, okay, so what's going on there when a woman is getting aroused by seeing something, uh, by seeing a penis? What I'm saying is an but erect penis but, is an exciting thing, and if it's not, but, and but you then say you're hetero, I'm just wondering how shut down, how the hell shut down are you, and is this indeed one of the reasons why these women are so enraged? Mm -hmm. Because we have been infantilized in the bedroom and in our own minds for so long that we see it all as a, at best, a, a mild affront. Women, right? what you're saying is that many women are denying many their women. own desire. Yes. Yes. Wow. Very effectively. Now, here's the question, Janet, that comes from that for me is then who is doing the infantilizing? The women to themselves or is it the patriarchy who created the female eunuch the idea oh. of the female eunuch is it women who did that or the well, men who oh. forced it on them because to me if you want to have if you want women to have agency if you yes. want to believe that which is your whole argument yes. right that they are yes. they're human beings and human beings have agency they make yes. choices including in sex right. work and everywhere else in life yes i would think that the logic here would lead us to conclude that they have chosen for whatever reason yes to to make themselves eunuchs yes. to be, to believe that yes. they are eunuchs it's hegemony in its purest sense okay but it's coming from the women it's, it's internalized not imposed, it's, it's not imposed an, on them is it or is it are well, they imposing it on okay. themselves okay um in in the on the continent of africa where genital cutting is extremely widespread, as mm -hmm. we know. Yep. It's not, you know, just little pockets, including in Egypt, very mm -hmm. widespread. It's not, it has nothing to do with race or even religion. It's among Christians and Muslims. It's a continental thing. And, but in the villages, it's a way of commodifying women. So you have to have this, uh, otherwise you will not get a husband. And that's your sole support, really. You can't make it on your own in those societies. So the women are the ones who enforce it, who do it, and it's called a rite of passage. It is a way of making women tractable, the same way that you would geld a horse. Hmm. So in our culture, uh, somewhere along the line, um, this lie back and do it for England, that, you know, the angel in the house and all of that stuff, all that came... In the Middle Ages, we believed that women were the animal half of the human race and that we had voracious sexual appetites, as they believe now in the Middle East, and that needed to be controlled. We were such highly erotic, eroticized beasts that we were incapable of reason. So we're not talking about achieving equality through, I'm just saying that without it, you are unconsciously participating in this hegemony in this patriarchy that is however maybe it's not a patriarchy maybe it's a matriarchy because mothers don't have sex well, mothers don't desire sex in our culture right that's, well, that's well the I, idea think, of the mother. I think what happens is that women internalize it and they enforce it yep. amongst themselves yeah. etc it's a way of commodifying yourself as well the mm -hmm. disconnect between the way women dress etc etc it's to make themselves desirable to men mm -hmm. because men are the ones who have desire. So we objectify ourselves, of course, but it's all part of the commodification mm -hmm. of females. And I think one of the ways that if we're ever really going to be uh, free and do away with this patriarchy is we're going to have to get in touch with our sexuality. We're just going to have to, because why would you not? I think maybe we should do away with both the terms patriarchy and matriarchy because what i'm suggesting here yeah based on some of the evidence that you're giving me now yeah is that it is just a, a system of repression basically yes repression. that serves many functions serves many for functions. many different people that's right but that what i want to say is that yeah. men and women yeah i think have have been equal in yes. its creation absolutely and it's main and it's maintenance yeah. so here's here's some examples puritanism the, yeah. pu the actual Puritans who yes. came here, the first white settlers here. Uh -huh. Those who know the history know that there were many, many women who were powerful, influential ministers in the Puritan churches, in the Puritan communities here. Anne Hutchinson was one of many, and it was also a relatively democratic denomination. The Puritans were quite 
quite democratic. I wouldn't call them feminists, but they were certainly far closer to gender equality. Than they were leaders. Most other, yeah, most other religious dom- denominations. And charismatic and, and, and nations everything. and all the rest of it, yeah. yeah. And so, and of course, the women who were leaders in the Puritan churches were really puritanical about sex, and they came up with but this were idea. They? Sure. I don't know. Elmer Gantry, have you ever read that by uh, Sinclair? No. Oh, Christ, that's a great book. Well, at least, I mean, in terms of their public statements. In terms of, but they were hypocrites, said, just the, like the oh, oh, sure. that's born against. Oh, everybody's a hypocrite. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I'm talking about what, I'm talking about the ideology that they created. This, yeah, but they were hip. This way of thinking. I know, sure, but everybody is. Hang on. So, yeah. So they are absolutely co-inventing what we now know as Puritanism, sexual Puritanism. And at the core of it, as we've been saying, is this idea that women, and in particular, don't have real sexual desire. They're inventing the idea that women are naturally suited to be mothers, and mothers don't have sex. Mothers don't even want to have sex, right? And so it's women who are at the beginning, at least in this country, creating this damn thing. And then it gets amplified. Hang on a second. During the American Revolution, this idea is created with the beginning of the United States of America. It's called Republican motherhood. I don't know if you've heard about this. Abigail Adams, you may have heard oh, yes, her yes, famous yes, exchanges sure. with her husband, John Adams. Yes. Where she's portrayed as the first feminist in this country and in ways she was. But she was also creating this idea of the Republican mother. The mother's role in the new nation was to create good citizens who were self-regulating, disciplined, they didn't use this word, but this is what it really was, repressed individuals. Mothers would have this tremendous responsibility, obligation to create good, disciplined, repressed Americans, their sons and daughters. And they would not want to have sex. They would only have sex for procreation, to produce but citizens for this But you see this, this only country. having sex for procreation is, I think, what's at the basis of the fact that women are so inhibited when it comes to orgasm and sex because they just don't feel as if it matters it's important it's 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 just frivolous and it's beside the point and it's not worth pursuing and so they don't and and it has to do with this idea of sex being you know linked with with inextricably linked with procreation or or not or you're not supposed to be having it at all you know, Gore Vidal said, when they have you by the short hairs, they've really got you. So it is a way of, of, of control. But I know that I've read all this stuff from the UN, and these are women speaking on their own behalf, the ones who've been, um, some of them have had not only their clitoris cut off, but their labia as well, and they've been sewed up. And, every, and oh, there's all kinds of infection and pain that goes with that. I mean, this is a lifelong problem for a lot of these women, but they're very proud almost like matcha proud and they say male sex the pleasure print the pleasure principle that's a frivolous superficial Mm -hmm. thing Mm -hmm. they said you can cut off all of our genitalia you know the super and we're still women we're still the mothers okay so they identify themselves if anything the mothers of sons that's where the power is power but the direct relationship between a man and a woman and the idea of romantic love that we all, we also cherish in this culture is completely foreign to them. Mm-hmm. So they identify themselves as a the mother of sons. They think of sexual pleasure as being this frivolous, silly male thing that they're above. And they're so happy they're free from it that they're not, you know, driven by it like these silly men. It's a very interesting thing. And I think a lot of that is de facto the case here men who I'm very close to who are honest with me and said, well, you know, I always thought of women as being above it all and not needing it the way I do. Mm. They're so lucky they don't need it. And that's echoes of these uh, women in in these uh, villages. If women are in touch with their sexuality, I would vouchsafe to say, of course, obviously I'm speaking for myself, which can't really generalize off of that, but Mm. I think women would be I, I, you know, utterly enslaved by their drives if they were free to experience them. Oh, really? Yes. So they would be jerking off in front of us. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and men would be going, like my friend, is my, is my dear friend Bill, who I even told you about, the one who made me go back to school and mm-hmm. everything. And we have this little joke of like, you know, oh, yes, I saw her breast and I was 
I was horrified. I was traumatized. It was a nightmare, he says. It was a nightmare. It's like a joke, right? I mean, this, you know, my, my, all my dear friends are porn addicts. You know, so we're, we're kidding here. He's not really hmm. traumatized with the sight of a female breast, but isn't that what's happening here? And also the other thing that I was really struck by with the Harvey Weinstein, now we're really getting into sensitive mm -hmm. territory. <laughs> no, I don't like horrible, ugly old men. First of all, he's so ugly. He must be so angry at women. There you go. Don't you think uh, oh, that's a big part of it? Oh, angry yeah. and desperate. The only way he was going to get it is to force himself. That's for sure. I mean, what a toad. But there comes a time in a really ambitious actress's life when if what's standing between her and that Oscar-worthy role is a blowjob, I think there are women who made that bargain. They made that Faustian bargain, okay? They behaved like hookers. They said, oh, a blowjob, well, it's a yuck, it's creepy, you know what, it's gonna last five minutes, and on the other side of that is this Oscar-worthy role, what the hell? Now, I think it's kind of hypocritical, not that I think that's the way business should be done, I'm not condoning it, but I also, if it were me and I were in that situation, I would definitely go for the blowjob rather than stand like, how dare you? It's a blowjob for Christ's sake. Now, I, that's because if I were ambitious and I you know, wanted to be a star and I saw this great role, it wouldn't be a blowjob that stands between me and that role, I'll tell you that right now. Mm -hmm. But then afterwards to come back and say, oh, you know, this, I, I was a victim. And I don't think so. I think a lot of times there was agency there and there's a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking or a lot of r revisionist history going on. Yeah. The belief that we were damaged by sex, some sexual oh, exactly. encounter in our past. Thank you. That's an interesting thing. We've, no, we've known from many psychological studies of so-called victims of molestation. Yes. That I think it's I think it's a majority of the victims say that the ma the the main pain that they feel is about having enjoyed it. Yes. So Yes. and having willingly gone and that's along why, with it yes, because they I, enjoyed it. And I think that's why it is wrong to prey on children because I think you have a responsibility okay, to to be their caretakers. And that, so therefore, I'm not, you know, I'm not a particularly, uh, but I do but, think so that- So in other words, that's an invented idea. It's right? an invented idea, yes. There's the thing that happens right now, the blowjob right. or the priest fondles you, right. whatever it is. Okay? Right. And then there's the question of what you think about the thing. Exactly. As with everything else in life. Exactly. There's the phenomenon. That's right. And then there's what we think about the phenomenon. That's right. And the, what we think about the phenomenon can change, but there has to be, there's a moment of invention yeah. of an idea about yes. the thing. The thing doesn't yes. speak for itself. It's a it, natural, my mother used there, to say, my, God bless her, that, say, I come by this honestly. She's saying, but I don't get it. It's a natural bodily function. What's all this hysteria about? It's just a natural, she said, the Greeks understood, you know, they, Dionysus and Apollo were best friends. The spirit and the body were best friends. And, and what's happened in this Manichaean Judeo-Christian thing of the body is at war with the mind or the spirit, you know, I think that's really at the heart here. And it's, it's a shame because it does lead to all of this uh, m mental illness is what mm -hmm. the way I, I just, I. So we can think of certain phenomena as just transient. This thing happens and then we forget about it. We move along like, you know, I don't know, you buy a subway token and then you yeah. forget about it, right? Yeah. And I guess you're suggesting that we can we could think that about a blowjob that's given in service of our career. A grown woman giving a blowjob is how many women have done that for it one reason or another? It could be even icky in, the, in yeah. the moment or even really unpleasant in the yeah. moment, but it doesn't, you're saying, have to stay with you. It doesn't have to be some damage well, that I'll, you have sustained that might be permanent. Yeah, that's the Tennessee way Williams thought of. Has, that, has that line. It's one of my favorite lines, and I can't, I'm not going to do it justice. But in Streetcar, uh, Blanche says the only sin that I've ever, you know, is human cruelty. Hmm. 
And that's terribly, I'm terribly paraphrased, but that's really what it comes down to. Now, I worked in advertising for many years, and I think a lot of this abuse of power is legit. I do think people in our capitalist system, a hierarchical cap, they abuse the power. But I, I've had women and men with no, nothing to do with sex humiliate me, uh, try to scare me, um, in, in every way, de dehumanize me, had nothing to do with sex. Mm -hmm. Sex is special, though. It's especially uniquely dangerous, powerful, Apparently, and damaging. So I guess. If you, if you were, say so, I don't. I never experienced it that way. Yeah, but. no, I know. <laughs> this is why. Yeah. This is why I'm here. And this is yeah. why you wrote that book. And but I think that maybe you're speaking for a lot of people, men and women, actually, who aren't speaking yet, who aren't letting this be known, that for them, it's a strange thing actually to believe that some sex act will damage me permanently, because that's the way a lot of people in the Me Too movement, so called, think, isn't it? It's not even sex act. Sometimes they're talking about like yeah. a touching of the, the knee. The sight of a penis. I was a nightmare. Right. Ten, I was traumatized. Ten, 20 can, years ago, what? a man brushed me, yeah. you know, touched my ass yeah. on the subway. And Katie I Royf, will never forget this. Katie Roy wrote the most wonderful essay. I think it was an op in the Times, which wouldn't even appear in the Times now. It was, there was a rash of um, uh, those guys who expose themselves. And these, they, they were, it was the same kind of hysterical reaction. Oh, oh my God, flashing. it was flashing. Yeah. And so Katie Ruff wrote this wonderful thing about, hey, come on, it's a penis. What is the big whoop here? Well, I think what yeah. you're saying, and I think what Katie Roy yeah. is saying, and this is what I would say, yeah. which is you can interpret that any way you want. And yeah. I, that's your decision. If you yeah. think that is horribly damaging yeah. and your life is over because okay. of it, or that it's just right. a, a really a traumatic thing in your life, yeah. or if it's anything, or is just, or is good and yeah. pleasurable, like you're yeah. saying it might be, right? Right. Or... Or it was just nothing. It was insignificant. It was like buying a subway token. Those are all your choices. You can interpret this in any way, is I think what you're saying. And that's all up to you entirely, and you're not wrong or right, no matter which you choose. But you do have a choice. You do have a choice. You have agency as to how we interpret this and how we let it affect ourselves, right? Because one of the things you learn in cognitive behavioral therapy right away is this. We have a choice as to how we interpret anything in our lives, anything whether it's the death of a child or rape or you name it, we can interpret this and as damaging and harmful forever or not or something in between. We can choose to make ourselves unhappy. We can choose to make ourselves victims or not, regardless of what it is. Right. And so I think that's what you're saying. I, I, I That's beautifully put what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I yeah. think... And I also don't even hear you, I mean, maybe a little bit it sneaks in there. I can't blame yeah. you because there's got to be a lot of frustration. <laughs> there's, but you're not even moralizing so much about like women should feel more like me. Women should embrace it when someone shows their cock at a no, nightclub. No. You're just saying you have a choice. No, all I'm saying is. Of how you feel if, about let's it. Just, I mean, in a st let's just say we, we were restored to our sexual cells our true nature and I have a line in my book where I say why aren't women free to love desire itself I had a shrink at the time when I was writing the book and I yeah. told her how you know I was lucky because penises turned me on and so therefore you know it sort of made sense right for what and she said oh you think like a man in other words the idea of the mm -hmm. opposite sex turning you on that is it's apparently not a female. And I thought about that for a while and I thought, no. You know, in a in a in a sense, we're so warped, we're so distorted, we're so far removed from ourselves that we can no longer respond to the opposite sex in a spontaneous way. Can I can I uh, read you a quote from a, a great philosopher yeah. on this question? Yeah. Here it is. I told myself freedom is loving the opposite sex, or if you're gay, your own sex, same difference. Freedom is loving the whole thing because you love desire itself. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, yeah. Um, yeah. I, would, I would like to say that yeah. that is how I think of freedom, but I'm not saying that's how anyone else should think of freedom, but what you're doing... So in other words, I don't want to moralize, and I, I think you might not want to either. In other words, don't. 
I think talking about the natural, going back to our natural selves, I mean, that's tricky. You don't want to talk about nature because then you're making a claim but about I do. this thing I, you can't I'm not, find. I am not, but you can't ever prove that. I do. I do. I do want to talk about it in this sense. Yeah, not everybody has super strong libidos, okay? Some people might, eh, that, that's true. Foucault writes about that. And I, I've never, I could never even thought, I never even entertained the idea until I read that, oh, not everybody's like me, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, not everybody has this overwhelming id, when I, not even that I do anymore, but thank God. I'm kind of happy to be a little past that myself. But um, even so, the very idea, the prevailing notion that if a man exposes himself to you, you are victimized by that. To me, there is, I would like to moralize on that. I really would. <laughs> okay. What the hell? I mean, you know, not every guy is going to turn you on, I grant you, okay? But I'm talking about in principle. Why aren't you, in principle, the idea of an erect penis, why isn't that an exciting thing? thought let's put it that way hypothetically what you know no it's just the opposite it's like oh, that's a nightmare to mm -hmm. see an erect peak well if it's a nightmare and you're a grown woman what the hell is wrong with this okay so here's how how i handle it yes <laughs> so what i say to people like that is what are your values you know determine what your values are do you value money do you value career do you value motherhood do you value being a soldier in the Marine Corps? Do you value the pleasure I feel when my clitoris is stimulated in particular ways? Whatever it is, right? But first of all, a lot of people have never asked themselves that question. Like, what do you value? Thought through this. You, ha you did early on. You, you asked that question of yourself and then you answered it and then you went and pursued it. So once you know what your value is in life, then it's just a question of strategy. How do we get that? Exactly. Thing, right? okay. yep. So you found your strategy, you turned tricks right. and did drugs. Um, so if we were to find out from a woman that her value is sensual pleasure, bodily pleasure, then we can then it just becomes a, a question of strategy and it's a logical argument you would make, which is that you then are not doing you're not pursuing a strategy no, that's gonna no, get you that, you're right? Not, you're not going with me. No. By hold on, by 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 believing no. that seeing a dick is no. damaging. No. Okay. Let's put the shoe on the other foot. I really do think in this case, it's a fair analogy. Let's just say the tables were turned, okay? And a woman exposed herself to a man. Mm -hmm. And when it was unbidden. Right. All right? Would that man then turn to the world and say, it was a nightmare. I was traumatized no. by the sight of her vagina. No, we are no. agreeing. I think we're agreeing. We keep going. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I don't have to go further than that. I'm saying if you're in touch with your own desire, your own sexuality, all right, that is not going to be your public react. You're not going to say to the world, oh, my God, I saw her vagina. I'm, you know. So it seems like I think yeah. you're making a counter essentialist claim about women's sexuality. Exactly. Ah. Yes. Yeah, so we do disagree. So yes. I, I think that's a mistake. <laughs> Not a mistake, but I I, um, but I, 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 I don't do that. And I think you might want to think oh, about that. Oh, no. Because. Of course not. That's my whole. For me, real liberation is yeah, about no. making no claims. No, no, no. About I'm other not people. saying that you should walk around horny or get turned on by anybody. And I've had so many interesting conversations, I said, with, with my lesbian friends. I have a couple of very good lesbian friends. And honestly, they get so mystified when I start talking about penises, period, because they are really in true. They, they, it, it, it's almost impossible that, for them to conceive of anybody being turned on by a penis. It's just so right. alien to them. My goodness. And yeah, but you know, there are gay men among who are, I have some good gay friends I've had frank conversations with on this subject. And they feel the same way about the vagina. I mean, really, if you said to, if you expose yourself to a gay man, he would be traumatized, okay? <laughs> All right? Well. So I'm talking about if you're heterosexual and therefore desire the opposite sex, mm -hmm. that's true. Sure. It has to be, you know, qualified that way. No, no, no. But aren't you suggesting that the female libido is naturally the same as the male libido? No, I think it's... I, I, as I say, in the Middle East, 
Nine Parts Desire. Mm -hmm. You know, that book the is Quran a classic. Well, I was going to say, I love that you referenced the Quran because when I taught the Quran at yes. Columbia, the first thing I noticed was, oh my God, first of all, there's sexual pleasure in here that's okay to have. And nine even parts women, of it were given to women. Even women Not are allowed to women. have sexual pleasure. Not even women were given it. Ten parts desire yeah. did Allah give to, to yeah. humankind. Nine parts did he give to woman. Right. Whereas okay. there's zero sexual and in, desire in, you in the know, Bible. There's all these references right. in Shakespeare, if you read Shakespeare mm -hmm. carefully. There it is. Women are centaurs. They're beasts down below. As I was telling you in Barbara Tuckman's A Distant Mirror, the common prevailing belief then was in the 15th century that women had to have vaginal orgasms in order to get pregnant. So what that tells me is they knew how to do it. They hadn't lost their, you know, yeah. ability to do it together. Anyway, so well, that I, I just okay. you know, so I I'm saying we are that far removed from ourselves. You know what the difference is between you and me? What? Freud and Foucault. You're taking a Freudian position and I'm taking a Foucaultian position. Freud, right, believes that there's this id and then there's the superego which represses the id which is this claim that the id, there's this thing that's like natural and essential inside of us, right? Biological, that's Freud's claim, right? That everybody has it and it just gets repressed, which I like, except for the natural part. Like, I don't think you can ever prove that there's a particular set of desires that we're born with that's built into the body. Well, how about when you get hungry? Whereas Foucault says there's no such thing as natural anything, especially when it comes to desires and things well, like how, sexual. I do think libido. we, you know, they say it's the second strongest drive after the need to eat. They say. They've also well, said they've they've also said other things. <laughs> they've you know, they've also said the opposite. Right? About it, women. That's an essentialist claim. That that women have no desire. No, no, but what I'm trying to say is that in other cultures and in other times, yeah. just the opposite was it sure. was the prevailing belief was that women were the much more highly eroticized we were mm -hmm. we were beasts. We weren't capable of reason. I mean and therefore, it was used as a rationale for why we're not, you know, allowed out of the house because sure. we're such highly sexed creatures that we we can't even uh, control ourselves. Right. Okay. So I'm just saying this: the prevailing belief now, you know, that women don't have that kind of urgent sexual desire that men have is simply that it's a belief. I agree with and, that. And when if you're talking about individuals, I mean, the hell with the individuals run the gamut. Of course they do. It's a but it's a belief or a it's claim a belief that system. all women, all women, yeah, women as a sex, as right. a group or as a class, right. have this thing about them. They right. have a lack of sexual desire. Right. So that's a universalist claim about women. I think which so. Which almost by definition is sexist because it's making a claim about an entire sex. First of all, it's placing this whole mass of human beings into a sex into a category and then saying about that category that it has this lack of desire right well we're gelding ourselves so now foucault yes right says yeah yes. that's all an invention and he can show exactly he shows you and feminist exactly. historians have done the yeah. work on this they've shown yeah the history of the creation and maintenance of that set of ideas yes so then they show that it was invented in this particular time so it right. has no natural origin right right you don't see it in nature you don't see it coming from god it was created by human beings right for various purposes well what he was so, saying really is heterosexuality per se this adhe strict adherence no yeah Foucault says everything's yeah. invented everything yeah i, I, I mean well, that's yeah. where I want you to go. Yeah. <laughs> I want you. No, absolutely. You know what I mean? So in other absolutely. words, absolutely. But which, that's, that's and then therefore you have a choice, he says. Yeah. Therefore, you have a choice to be gay or straight or a woman or a man or anything you want. But that's still getting or something away new. from that's still getting away from what I'm what I'm talking about is in a if you're a heterosexual. OK, then by definition, if you are in touch with your own desire, you're turned on by the opposite sex. Oh, if you choose to identify as heterosexual, if you choose to have those desires, if you choose then, to... Then, if so, yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. In that construct, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's see, you're a declared by the hetero. Way, so people, I know people are freaking out hearing that. I mean, that could even be an unconscious choice. That's what I believe heterosexuality is. Right. It's an unconscious, usually an unconscious choice, but it's still a choice. You're not born any way, any particular way. You know, I really, I really don't know. That I don't either. I, I well, really I, don't I, know. I should take that back. That's right. I don't know either. I, honestly. And the point it, Foucault makes is you don't know either. You can't prove it. 
I don't. You know. can't prove that you were born a particular way. But let's way. say you're a self-declared heterosexual. Is sure. what I'm talking about. Sure. Okay, so that means yeah, that means I think at least theoretically in the main, the idea of the opposite sex would be a turn on. Mm -hmm. right. And and the, and the problem with the prevailing thing now is that any time that a man. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it behaves in a sexual way that it's threatening and you're a victim. Now, if you're 10 years old, yes. But yeah. I think so what Foucault to presume and I say, that yeah. that's hostile, <laughs> that it's hostile, it's, it's, it's saying, well, but I'm a, I'm a eunuch. I have no desire. I'm just a vessel. And I get to choose who uses me. And you're not the guy I'm choosing. Therefore, what you're doing is aggressive and hostile. Whereas if my boyfriend does it, it's okay. Yeah. But that, but but it's not. There's no agency there, really. Right. So they're choosing to be eunuchs and they're choosing yes. to be victims. Both. Yes. Exactly. And I yes. think you're saying you don't have to be, and I agree with you there. I I, I just think there's something is off is really wrong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so I think I think according to my own values that the yeah. way that you choose to live and or at least the way you think about yeah. living is is it, it meets my needs right? right i just don't want to impose my values on other people but i want to say that everybody should read your book thank you and see that no but That's listen lovely. not just because it's well written or anything <laughs> i'm saying that everybody should read your book yes and here's a different way of thinking about your own body about sexuality about freedom about pleasure take it or leave it but here's this thing, it can happen. You can actually do all these things and then 30 years later or 40 years later, you'll be sitting in a nice apartment on West 12th Street and everything will be fine. It's not the end of the world. In fact, you might even like it along the way, right? And that's, so it's this, you're just giving them an alternative. Well, I do think in that sense that women have been prescribed by um, Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton, which I talk about a lot, is 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 a, a deeply feminist book because the the only women who are valued enough to be cared for and respected and um, treated well are tabula rasas, young women with zero experience. And the more experience you have, the more you're devalued by it. And I think that we internalize that a lot too. Mm -hmm. Um, not so much anymore, but it's still there. It's still lurking. The idea that a woman uh, will be branded by experience to the point where she can no longer reenter society, that's really where I, I think my defiance uh, was, was quite serious, in that I saw this all as a dark adventure, and um, thank God I survived it. You know, at the end, it got very dark because of drugs and alcohol, not because of sex, because of drugs and alcohol. Thank God I survived that. But nonetheless, it was an adventure. And I learned a lot, too. I was trying to commit class suicide, too. It was hyperventilating. It's just so insular up there on the Upper East Side. It yeah. really it still is. Class suicide, and you're also yeah. committing race suicide. And race suicide yeah, so as well. We haven't well. gotten to this. Let's talk about this. Yeah. You haven't read my book, but I can tell you this. One of the major themes, possibly the major theme in the book yeah. throughout is what I call whiteness. Yeah. I think of whiteness very differently than the way that all the social activists now talk about whiteness, the way that it's talked about in the media and among people on the left. They tend to talk about it sort of as simply a system of punishment, oppression. They think of it as oppression, which it certainly has been. That's been a part of it. What they don't talk about is that it's also a system of repression. For me, whiteness is most important as a system of repression of white people. There has also been oppression of others who don't live up to the standards of whiteness, certainly, but it begins, I believe, with a repression of our own desires, the stuff that you've been talking about. So I think you and I agree on this, at least in this country, being white or whiteness has been associated for at least 200 years with the repression of sexual desire, the repression of bodily desires generally, 
the repression of the body and that kind of freedom that you so value. White people live in boxes. White people <laughs> wear business suits. White people are engineers and mathematicians. White people work. White people are married. White people don't fuck around. White people don't do speed. White people most certainly don't sell sex. And black people and brown people and other people, they're the ones who live of the body. They are of the body. We are of the mind. We are of rationality and reason. This dichotomy you mentioned earlier that was established in Western culture way, way back, basically with Plato and the Greeks. The body is bad. That's where sex is. The mind is good. That's where rationality is. I don't think the Greeks subscribe to that. Plato certainly did. Plato's Republic is all about this. The mind-body duality is right there. However, their cosmology, the idea that Apollo and Dionysus this is were why, best friends. This, and this is why Socrates was put to death. Put to death, right. Because he said to them right. that your gods right. are not good because they're too much of the body. Here's a better way okay. to live. Okay. So my republic, okay. Plato's Republic, yeah. will look like this, this perfectly ordered society yeah. in which everybody follows their role. Platonic. And that it is organized by philosophers who are of the mind, yeah. who are rational and logical and not... Yeah do not succumb to their bodily desires. Right. It's not chaotic. It's all perfectly efficient and orderly. It's, it's platonic, yeah. And then many hundreds of years later, yeah. people in this place where we're sitting now yeah. in the United States said, yeah, you know what? That mind stuff, that's what we do. That's what white people do. That's yeah, what that's makes us better. Voltaire's bastards, John yeah. Wilson Soul. Oh, my God. That's a history of... It says this, too. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, so, and what they're saying is, first of all, that being repressed, because that's how you and I think of this, uh, is good. Being of the mind is really being repressed. It's wearing a business suit and going to a, a cubicle and staying there all day and being uh, having sex with the same person your entire life. That's good. Number one, that's good. And number two, that's what white people do. And so bot the body is what the other people do. The dark people, in particular in this country, that's what black people do. So whiteness, to me, is really about repression fundamentally. And blackness, in the way we th have thought about it, is freedom the way we thought about it, right? The extent to which actual white-skinned people have repressed themselves is a different question, and the extent to which dark-skinned people have been liberated is an, also another question. But just in terms of ideas, that's how we've organized our society. We've organized it around those ideas. And so you were not only being a class trader by becoming a hooker on the streets and a drug addict, you were also very much being a race trader in this way, which is that you were not just doing something that a good white girl wouldn't do, it's that you were living in the body, of the body. You were of the body. You were reveling in the body. And that's only what niggers do, Janet. Yeah, I mean, I experienced it more exclusively as it was more of a rebellion as a woman obviously, but class suicide most definitely. I mean, I my experience um, with people of color has been that they're afflicted in all the same ways that I am. You well, know, they're, they're suffering from the same inhibitions and repressions. I mean, I think it's uh, pretty widespread and it goes pretty far and wide. However, I do think this. In a lot of working class cultures, and maybe this is true in the Ozarks too, I don't know. Indeed. <laughs> I've spent very little time there. Indeed it is. Um, there is less value put on postponing immediate gratification. There you and go. therefore, I think that it's something they've been able to hold on to or mm -hmm. retain that we lost, that we traded for other mm -hmm. things, like you said, mostly for power and, and money. And, not, and skyscrapers. And skyscrapers. Because you have to repress yourself to and build those things. skyscrapers. But, you know, like somebody like Melania, that was a very fair deal, hmm. she thought at hmm. the time. Okay, the guy's a boob and he's a clown, but I'm going to live really well. And that was, she probably made that trade very consciously. Mm -hmm. You know, now she's kicking herself. Because he's more than just a boob. Well, you he, know, add, he added something to the trade after the yeah, contract was I mean, signed. But he was he's like, oh, you didn't see the sinister. line about being president and being but a first he, lady? he's a sinister character, and I think she's getting hip to that. I really, I could see it in her face. She wouldn't even stand up for the guy. She is clearly not enjoying herself. No. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, 
It's, uh, but the idea that you could do that even, you, you have to be able to, repre to be fairly repressed or to be able to. Oh, good God. Right? To marry for money, for instance. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, I thought you meant you being, have to being, put president aside, or being president yeah. or first lady. So those are the paragons right. of this repression but, we're but talking it, about. But there, I'm, again, as I'm saying, as a woman, I'm speaking now. Because uh, uh, Trump has his uh, Stormy Daniels and everybody. And um, he, th I'm sure he thinks it's his birthright as a you know, misogynist guy. So you, you definitely are pro-Trump, though, aren't you? Because you have to be. No, uh, here, um, here's the thing. He thinks that this is his the deal because he's a guy he's not supposed to be faithful he think you pay lip service to that for like five minutes during the wedding ceremony yeah the reason that people hate him so much yeah has almost nothing to do with his actual policies which yeah. I act, which i do hate on immigration and foreign policy no i, I think he's he's murderous he's murderous i That's think what this what's so fascinating speaking of race is that i was at a left forum thing mm -hmm. it was a, one of their and it was um Jill Stein, who was running for Green president Party. of the Green Party ticket, mm -hmm. um, Chris Hedges, and one of my personal heroes he, to the extreme, Glenn Ford, who has yeah. a, a weekly newspaper. The Black Agenda Report, Thank you. which I love. Yeah, love me Glenn too, Ford. which yeah. I love. And it, when I want information, when I want to know, and, I, and Glenn has a lot of experience as a car, Washington correspondent. He started out very early on, very young, Black Panther. Uh, he's in his late 60s. He was a black, young, young Black Panther. And then, like many of us, I think, he, he drifted into the mainstream for a while, and now he's way back out on the left. And he, but he's such a resourceful and terrific, and everybody who works for the Black Agenda Report, they really know what the hell. I mean, the, you know, I, I trust them, and um, they have really viable sources. And they give me real information about what the hell's going on. So Glenn Ford says, this, this Jewish guy raises his hand at this forum, and he says, we, Trump is really dangerous, and we, you, we've got to vote for Hillary because you've got to believe me, he's really dangerous. And Glenn Ford, very quiet, always speaks very, you know, the most eloquent man I ever heard, except for um, Chairman O'Malley, I should tell of those two, the most eloquent men I've ever heard. But Glenn Ford is um, so articulate, so quiet, and he says, look, if you're trying to scare us, you know, what, what, what are you talking about here? Stormtroopers? You know, uh, concentration camps? Uh, murder in the street? You know, he just went down the line. He said, we got that. You can't scare us. Yeah. All right, so it's kind of like Trump from where he's coming from is like, welcome to my world. They're kind of giggling in a way because this is what it's like right. to be black oh. in this country. You see yeah. what I'm trying to say? It's like the laws don't apply to you. You already live in a lawless fascist society. I mean, that's a fact Right. So for Glenn, the black working class. So the black anyway. ag I've loved the Black Agenda report Me since too. 2007, which was okay. when they emerged yes. on the left. I didn't discover them till around 2000. This is when Obama's running. And yes. the reason that they yes. made a name for themselves, this is Glenn Ford, Bruce Dixon, and Margaret Kimberly exactly. are the main writers for Black yes. Agenda report. They're teeny tiny, have virtually no funding, and they are shunned by much of even the left. But they're, right. they're hardcore, basically Marxists. Nonetheless, even if you're an anti-Marxist, you should really appreciate what they were doing all the way through the but Obama administration, which was traditional Marxists. No, no, they're for sure. black working class. So absolutely. So well, we'll get to that in a second. But they, yeah. they, they really set themselves apart by being relentless, fierce, consistent, principled critics of Obama in exactly the way they were of Bush. Okay. And they also said, and they were the ones to show this repeatedly, that Obama in terms of actual policy, in terms of actual material effects on human beings, including black people, is essentially the same as every other goddamn president ever, no regardless kidding. of skin color. So here's how I, I discovered, so I yeah, love go them. ahead. Yes, yeah. yeah, so ahead, here's yeah. how I discovered O'Malley Eschatella and subsequently Glenn Ford. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm in St. Petersburg and I see this little pamphlet and it's this black man speaking out against Obama in 2008 when he was running against Hillary I didn't know of any other black person, and I thought there was something weird about this Obama. He was playing it so close to the vest. He never even came out for single-payer health insurance or anything. Let, and he never talked about the poor, nothing. So I thought, what's with this guy? So sure enough, I go to hear Amalia Chattel, 
And it was like, I mean, it was totally revelatory. It woke me up. And one of the things that he said was that Obama was going to get away with doing things that yep. no white conservative male would ever dare to try mm, to do. Exactly. And sure enough, if the wars didn't escalate under this man, sure enough, if he didn't become king of the drones, mm -hmm. et cetera, all the way down the line, that codicil that, that now you could be seized by your government and held indefinitely mm -hmm. without habeas corpus, um, that was under, it was under And, a, and liberals Obama. just sort of think, Obama's oh, yeah. awesome. Yeah. Even though he did all those yeah. things. Yeah. But it was but it was obviously a black man who who uh awoke me up to this. And then I discovered Glenn Ford. I discovered this whole black intelligentsia, which to me is so vital, so alive, because they're really experiencing, they're under the thumb of this. And so I can trust them in a way that I cannot trust my own race, frankly, when it comes to, you know. Uh, changing the system, I think these are the people best equipped to to lead me, to spearhead this. Yeah. So That's I, the way I feel about it. Clearly, I am a big fan of the black, I guess we would call it left, you know, and I, we were talking about Malcolm X earlier. and I You would I'll, love Omalia Chatella. Maybe, yeah. A lot yeah. of his critique, a lot yeah. of Malcolm's critique, yeah. uh, I think is, is right on, and I really wish he were with us today because he would have a yeah. lot to say about what's going on. But right. I, I was sort of mentioning this to you earlier before yeah. we started recording, but there's a bit of a disappointment, though, even on the black left that we like historically. I don't know what Black Agenda or Report's sexual politics are, and that kind of tells us a lot, right? Yeah. They are like pretty much everybody else in politics, left, right, center, liberal, conservative. They don't talk about it. So, so that's, that's what I call the bourgeois silence, the great bourgeois silence about sex. There's a repression there as well. They are so, this is so funny in this, yeah. I, I belong to the, I'm so happy you're talking about this because it's been deeply, I'm deeply conflicted here. I belong to this, the um, solidarity movement, which is under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. Mm -hmm. And because of Ferguson and everything else, this has attracted a great many, there's white and black people in this movement, Africans we call them colonized Africans, that's how they refer to themselves. There's, But there's a many white people in this solidarity movement, right? And since Ferguson, this attracted all kinds of young, black, and white people. The white people are mostly from college campuses. Um, they're, they refuse to be gender identified. You know, mm -hmm. they're non-conforming gender people. And um, it's a wonderful motley bunch right yep and yet they are at this having said that when they you know they are the the most puritanical yes. bunch, and they are so righteous about it and um i it, i'm not I've, surprised i i i i have to say i and they finally came out in their paper their wonderful burning spear monthly paper last year they came out against genital cutting because I, which I was very happy about. But the rationale that they used is that it commodifies women and that, uh, why can't they just say it's freaking immoral mm -hmm. to do that to another human being? See what I'm trying to say? They can't go that little one extra step and just say it's wrong. Well, forget about morality. They're not taking the side of- I mean, the of, left. But wait, 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 they're not taking the side of sexual pleasure. Oh, God, no. That's my point. Oh, here. yeah. That's no, my no, point no. here. No, you're so, absolutely right. So Frederick Douglass yes. never mentioned no, sexual pleasure. Ida B. Right. Wells never mentioned it. A. Philip Randolph never mentioned it. Martin Luther King did mention it and said it was de the devil's work and that African-Americans needed to stop being sexual. Malcolm X was as puritanical as anybody could be, at least in their, his public pronouncements. The Nation of Islam, tremendously puritanical. Every political movement, oh, left, yeah. right, or yeah. center, even the radical, radical left, has been this way for hundreds of years. And that was my great sadness at first about it. And that's why I left the sadness. left. I left yeah. the left, and I don't identify yeah. as a leftist anymore because I don't see anybody in the left, yeah. except for maybe you, who uh, even talks about this stuff. Who even talks about this stuff, much less, much less promote it or celebrate it. And so it I think it's a dead cry. end. I think it's a dead it, end it makes to me go want to cry because they, you know, there's an urgency about poverty and I, my third book is called The Hot Stove and it's all about this and 
it's set against this backdrop of the African People's Socialist Party and the, the Solidarity Movement, which I've been a part of. And it's such a serious um, conundrum for me because I feel once again that I have to deny my experience in order to serve this very urgent, because there ain't nothing worse than dire poverty. Mm -hmm. And when you think that 80% of the world is living on less than $10 a day, and of that, half of that is living on less than $2 a day, we know that we are colluding somehow in this. This system does not work for the majority. Forget the planet itself, for the majority of people on it. Does not work. And I think it's so urgent and it's so dire that I tend to think, oh, well, the fact that all of my life I've stood for this other kind of freedom, right. I, I, you know I don't... What, you know what that is? It's frivolous. It's frivolous. See, that's what exactly. They think. It's mm -hmm. frivolous. Exactly. And I've written a whole essay because about Because there are more frivolity. important things. Because there are more important things Like than fixing that. poverty and reorganizing society. If you're going to reorganize society, which every left yeah. movement has yeah. wanted, right? You have to put aside frivolous things like sex. Well, I have a problem with the nuclear family, period. Mm -hmm. So let's start there. Yeah. You know, let's so, start there. And let's please not deify mothers anymore, okay? Yeah. I'm getting so tired of that, man. So one of the, the one of the things I wanted to say to you. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons I came here is to say that to you, is to say that the left, I believe, if you're really interested in sexual freedom in the way that you are, the left, at least as it is constituted now, is not the place for you. In fact, I felt it. it's going to be your enemy. Oh, and no, so, it's not my enemy, but I've, I've felt well, always when they, uh, mm. uh, because of that. Uh, that I couldn't be as wholehearted and I couldn't embrace it as fully as I would have otherwise. So you you come out of yeah. the, what we called the new left of the late 60s and early 70s. There yeah. was this brief moment where people like Abby Hoffman there and was. some feminists yeah. were actually celebrating the things that you do. And what I'm my political project for many years now has been to to revive but that. But their argument would be that's a bourgeois preoccupation. The very idea of, you know, sexual oh, yeah. freedom is, is just a bourgeois. Right. Uh, yeah. So first of all, that's so, bullshit because I can tell them that the, the bourgeoisie invented repression. But anyway. Uh, no, but it, being, it, to be free from it, to be so preoccupied with that, you know, yeah. when there's when the majority of people don't even have water to drink. It is mm -hmm. comparatively frivolous. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do think so. But, the I, I but if you look at as you've been saying, I, I'm as, deeply conflicted. No, no, no. Until... But look, as as you've been saying all along yeah. here, when you look at the people who are poor, yeah, when the people who are working class, yeah, all over the world, they don't have these ideas about the female being a eunuch. They don't have these ideas about the nuclear family and lifelong monogamy. The slaves in the United States didn't have any of those ideas. They lived differently. They lived in ways that you and I would consider to be more liberated. I honestly, you know, I, I, I don't know that my preoc I do think my preoccupation is born out of, as you said, our whiteness, but it's crippling. I think it's mm. really crippling and, and therefore it is my hot stove, if you will, that Malcolm X talks about. That is my hot stove. Well, you know, as you move forward in this political world, in the left political yeah. world, just take note. Oh, take no, note I've of what already... people of what people think about sex, which is usually nothing. Or when they're asked, it'll be not positive. Well, no. So we they, need a well, new these, new left. These are young, expressive kids, okay, or, who are wildly uh, post gender and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, non-gender non-gender conforming i don't think that they don't think about sex i just don't think they i think it's worth talking about yeah. it's it's frivolous it's beside the point you know when you have okay uh, how are you going to change that how how am i going to change yeah, what would that? you tell them the other problem is i don't feel that i have a voice or that i should want to have a voice in this situation because supposedly committing class suicide by letting the you know the african working class have the main voice which i appreciate you know i respect them in in that situation but it does keep me from wholeheartedly being a revolutionary because i wouldn't want to live in a world where my freedom or my sense of freedom would have to be that compromised i just wouldn't so maybe it's because i'm born of privilege and there's just a certain point at which you know, that's going to get in the way. And maybe it's, um, 
maybe that's an issue, but there was a young man who was the head of the movement underneath the party, the broader movement. Very handsome young man. And apparently some women complained. These women, in a Me Too way, complained that he was coming on to them. He was taking advantage of his position as the president. He was immediately asked to step down. He had to leave immediately. They, were, they didn't hesitate. And I looked at this very good-looking guy, and I thought to myself, isn't it conceivable that some of these women came on to him or were attracted to him? Very, very gorgeous young man. And, oh, no, no, no. I mean, I, if I even tried to introduce this into it. It was like, no, 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 no. You know, that's it. Boom. And uh, so, yeah, I have, I have always had a serious problem with it because it, you're right. It's so unexamined. Let's put it that way. It's yeah. unexamined. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it might be a little worse than that. But you and I will talk again. But it's so wonderful to have someone to talk to about these things because I can't talk about it on the left, obviously. Yeah. It's verboten. You're right. right. Yeah. And there is a problem with that. Yeah. I have a serious problem. As an artist, I have a problem, let alone a... Yeah, I'm trying to start a new politics, Janet, and I want you to be a part of it. That's okay, what, what now, and you. this politics is... Not a group, is... not a party. Yeah. Just a new way of thinking. Just a new way of thinking that begins where you begin in your book that is really the political expression of what you say in your book. I saw that spirit, and that's what I want our politics to be about. We can talk more about that later. <laughs> next, I, time, next time I'm in New York, we'll do this. I'd love to talk to you more about it. I'd, I'd love to talk to you more about it. I just wonder in some way the urgency. I guess an environmentalist feel this too. There's such an urgency now because of the suffering there's always an urgency haven't you noticed there's always been an no, urgency no i do think no I, when in history if has there not been immense terrible human suffering see i i think for me and you have the same upbringing that i do so you know that, that for me well, the not quite, i but, can't yeah. i have to believe that i can in oh some, left wing you mean yes we have the same yeah, left wing upbringing that, yes, that, yes. That, that we can make a difference Mm -hmm. That it is up on us That's right. to to uh, to foment change. That's right. That it is not something that I can be passive about. Yep. At the same time, you've hit on the mother load right into the whoop and wharf of me, which is how am I going to be free yeah. if my, my preoccupations, the things that I think about, that what what drives me. Um, if there's no place for that, then I don't see myself in it. Yeah. Even though I would, I if I could, I would gladly. Be, there can't be a place for it if you're going to save the world. But yeah. you can't be frivolous if you have to save all those people in Africa. That's what I'm saying. I don't know. So maybe, I, maybe, I don't know. Maybe get rid of the savior complex. The well, I don't have a savior complex, but I, I am very. I'm devoted to these people and to to chairman yeah. yes to tell do they people, need do they need you oh no hell no oh no I I really need need them because I have the opportunity I get to go into the ghetto mm -hmm. all the time in St. Pete and listen to the chairman and see other um see what's going on in there like when I first heard in 2008 about young men being shot down in the street by the cops who were these unarmed young men. Um, there was nothing about it on the news, nowhere. There was a total blackout. There was absolutely no information. I'd never heard of anything like it. My first instinct as a white person was to think, what did they do to provoke it? Because cops, hmm. it's, you know, that, that was my first instinct. What did they do to, I had never heard of people getting shot down, you know, this domestic terrorism. Now we're all familiar with it. We all know about it. We only know the tip of the iceberg. We don't really know how widespread it is. But to live in those conditions, okay, of being terrorized, uh, where you can't get a loan for a small business from your own bank, even if you've been putting your paycheck in that bank every week of your life, okay, you can't get a loan out of the bank. All right, it's beyond not having reparations. 
it's uh, these it, it, it's exploitation in its purest simplest sense and to be able to witness that close up it seems to me to be urgent and it calls for action it calls on the part of white people for action mm. as well as on the part and it's it's an it's a a blessed opportunity to be able to engage to, to, to be able to engage and identify with the black working class. I mean, I'm, I consider myself very fortunate to be a part of that. However, I'm with you. I don't know what the future looks like. I can't conceive of a future including me in it. No, well, I, I agree with you. I think only they can liberate themselves. Like only women can liberate themselves. I don't. I disagree with you there too. Mm. I really think it's going to have to be okay. uh, on the part of heterosexuals. Well, can't qualify that. I disagree with you. I think men are going to have to be involved in this, honey. Then we're going to. I really do. <laughs> I do love that you called me honey. I mean, I really do because you never get that anymore. I love it. Um, it's part of our repressive culture that that's not allowed anymore. So I just we will take this up again. Yeah. We will take this up again. I and I'm glad. To. I'm thank you for giving me the opportunity to raise these questions with you. Thank you. I mean, I live with this. I can't tell you how much every day to the point where my third book, not my second book is Harem. My third book is The Hot Stove, which is a quote from Malcolm X. And it's about my hot stove versus the hot stove that I'm uh been privileged enough, if you will, to to be able to witness a bit, yeah. to have some access to, and it's reality. It's a reality beyond my little bubble of a world, I'll tell you that. Well, I will see you again, I promise. Oh, we'll I hope again. so. To be continued. Thank it's you. been fabulous. This was the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To sign up for the Renegade University webinars, visit ThaddeusRussell.com slash courses. To support the show and become a member of the Unregistered community, go to unregisteredlisteners.com. Thanks for listening.